Um, we're going to get started. This is the continuance of the hearing to address Carlino land development preliminary slash final land development plans. The board has scheduled the hearing today from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. Um, the chairman does have a, d a doctor's appointment that got rescheduled due to weather, and he will have to be leaving probably around 2. 2.30. 2.30. Um, he can participate via his cell phone on the way to his doctor's office. We'll, we'll deal with that um, as the day un unwinds. Maybe we'll be done by then. That would be awesome. Um, they also scheduled tomorrow, if necessary, from 9 until 3 p.m. So um, I have provided to all the board members, as well as the council, a supplement to the board exhibits. I had emailed these to all of the council yesterday to let them know that I was intending to mark these as additional board exhibits. I'm going to read through them now. They start at board 55. This is correspondence the township received from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. It's dated January 25th, 2019. And it indicates that with the proposed sewage facilities planning module, which proposes a reduction in estimated sewage flows, um, the project, the DEP has determined that sewage facilities planning is not required for the project. So that's board exhibit 55. Board exhibit 56, was something that LTL handed to us at the close of the last hearing. I do understand they will probably be marking it as well, but I wanted to try to get all these board exhibits in. So it's titled LTL Alternate Plan, dated January 21st, 2019. Board exhibit 57 is a letter dated February 4th, 2019 from Mr. Kaplan. Attached to that letter is a motion in limine seeking to have the board exclude the introduction or the admission of B56, which is the LTL alternate plan. Board 58 is a letter from Eugene Orlando dated February 15th, 2019, and that is a response and an objection to Mr. Kaplan's motion in limine. Board Exhibit 59 is a letter from Mr. Prince dated February 11th, 2019, seeking the entire board to recuse itself. Mr. Prince did hand to me this morning, and it's on top of the board's packets, four additional emails, which I'll call the supplement to his letter, and those collectively all will be part of B59. And the last board exhibit for right now is B60, which is a letter dated February 13th, 2019 from Mr. Kaplan in response to Mr. Prince's letter of February 11th, 2019. So that's the additional exhibits, B55 through B60. These additional board exhibits include materials and various motions that we have received since the close of the last hearing on January 22nd, 2019. The board and I would like each party to consent to the admission of these exhibits and obviate the need for any party to call a witness to authenticate them. All parties, I think all parties would agree that if those documents, that they're authentic and they were written by the party who drafted them, I would request that each party stipulate that if the author of the document were called to testify, the witness would testify under oath to the truth of the statement and make the expert opinions in those exhibits. The amount of weight and credibility to be given to those statements and opinions will be up to the board. And I do realize, Mr. Kaplan, that you have a motion in limine, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, obviously, each party would be given an opportunity to cross-examine. So the point of that is that Mr. Ulrich is here and whoever else prepared the LTL reports, I think the, if, if, in fact, the board accepts that as evidence, I'm not sure we need Mr. Ulrich or the other witness to restate what's stated in those reports. So that would be my advice to the board that they have it, they'll be given an opportunity to read it, um, and if Mr. Kaplan has, has had a copy, he, he'll have an opportunity to cross-examine. I think that would, that's how we've handled the other expert reports, the other uh, objections that have been written. We didn't need, and we don't need a witness to stand up and state exactly what's stated in those reports. So that's pretty much how, what, how we've handled it, and I'm hoping we can handle it that way. There are two, um, given the board motions that I've just marked, one was BVA's motion asking the board to recuse itself. I've carefully read through Mr. Prince's letter, February 11th, 2019. I believe that Mr. Prince is raising many of the same issues he's raised at the introductory hearing on December 12th. I reread the cases that deal with the board sitting in an adjudicative capacity and what standard they would have to apply to board recusal. I've also reread the municipality's planning code for guidance on that issue. 
and I do, I'm not aware of any authority for the entire board to delegate its responsibilities and its authority to act on a land development plan and to appoint a hearing officer unless the applicant asks for that. Mr. Kaplan, do you, I would assume you have an objection to the board recusing itself and appointing a hearing officer? Absolutely, okay. yes. So that being said, my advice to the board is that you uh, rule against the motion for recusal for all the reasons that we have previously stated at the various hearings. If the board agrees with that, it would be appropriate for somebody to make that motion. So moved. I second. All in favor. Aye. The second preliminary matter was the motion in limine that was filed by Mr. Kaplan, seeking the board not to allow the LTL alternate plan. Um, and obviously we had a response to that. My suggestion is sort of how we've done this before. The uh, strict rules of evidence don't apply to this hearing. Uh, the board can consider any relevant evidence. Um, the board can judge the relevancy and how much, let me say it this way, the, the board can judge how much weight it wants to give that plan, but I feel that to, to whatever extent it's relevant to the case, it should be admitted, and my advice would be that the board agree to rule against the motion in limine and to allow the LTA alternate plan in as, an, as evidence. I'll make a motion that we deny the motion in limine to um, preclude the admission of the plan. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And obviously your objection is noted, Mr. Kaplan, and your objection, Mr. Prince, clearly is noted on the recusal matter. So that is, if we're wrong on that, then the court will tell us. Um, with that, I think at this point it is L and R partnership. You were going to start with your witnesses. Excuse me, Madam Solicitor. Uh, I think the record should note that your Exhibit 56 that you handed out is only <clears throat> a few of the pages. That's right. I, in I, the report that was submitted, uh, I just want the record to be clear that the actual report was. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's right here. I this entire report is what's marked. I wasn't going to photocopy this for 10 people. So, Solicitor, no, yep. no issue. I just want the record to read sure. that the exhibit that is in the uh, book, as it were, is only the first few pages of the report and not the entirety of the report with supplemental exhibits. Right, and that's, that's, that's the practice I've followed for several of the very large reports. What I've passed out to everybody may not be the official entire report. For example, the stormwater analysis, the traffic impact. But yes, the record is the entire, however many, it looks like 300, 400 pages. Please proceed, Mr. Orlando. May I just, one quick item? Sure. That I think should go in the record. Yesterday, the Supreme Court dismissed the uh, Alicotter petition with regard to the condemnation action. And I uh, have a copy um, that I took off of the Supreme Court's website. And I think that this, uh, order dismissing or rejecting the petition for Alicotter <coughs> from the Commonwealth Court's decision. Commonwealth Court's decision in the condemnation action should be part of the record. I think that's consistent with how we, uh, yeah. Carlino too was a binder of cases. What I would say is we just attach that to your binder of cases and include it with another. Yeah. That, I that, mean, the, that would be fine. the board me, would be able to take judicial notice of it. So whether it's an exhibit or not, it's rather immaterial. But I think if the board has it as part of that agree, binder, agree, just, just so that was part of Carlino too. Thank you. And what is that order dated? Yesterday, Those, 20th of February. This is the record is clear. It's not an order that addresses the appeal on the merits. It just says that the Supreme Court does not grant a petition of Alicotter which means that they won't hear the case. Understood. Which means that the decision of the Commonwealth Court is final. I agree. Thank you. Mr. Orlando, would you like to proceed? Uh, Mike, I have a question. Where is Mr. Winters? He was traveling yesterday and indicated last evening he would be here. So we're expecting him to arrive. Okay. I, uh, I'm concerned that we don't have a full board complement. Uh, as we did on the 15th when Mr. Schridner had to leave early. Um, I believe I just saw him pull in, so I think he will be here in a, in a I, his truck just drove by, so I'm hoping that that was him pulling in the parking lot driving it. Why, and while, while we're waiting for Mr. Uh, Winters to come, uh, 
Scribner on the 15th of January missed some, what we think is extremely important testimony from Mr. Heinrich. I did watch the video, so I did get caught up for the last hour and a half. Thank you. For what it's worth. I was hoping I had the chance to do that. Because I believe a lot of the concerns that we have expressed were supported by Mr. Heinrich. In the developer's opening statement, Mr. Kaplan has made much and continues to argue that this is the fourth plan that's been presented to this township. And that there have been a number of judicial opinions that comment on various aspects of each of these prior plans. And Attorney Kaplan invites the board to use these decisions and the dicta in those decisions as a basis for reviewing this plan. Both the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and the Commonwealth Court have repeatedly said that collateral estoppel and race judicata do not generally apply to zoning and subdivision cases, except in extremely rare circumstances. In fact, Judge Nagel attempted to use collateral estoppel in the third plan case, and that was expressly rejected and overturned by the Commonwealth Court in Judge Pellegrini's April 18, 2018 opinion. Objection. This is oral argument. This is oral argument. I guess I'm confused where you're going with this, because I will guide the board on whether collateral estoppel and race... Where I'm going with this, ma'am, is that Mr. Kaplan was given 15 minutes to make an opening statement to summarize his position. Okay, well, you didn't say you were making an opening statement. If you had started by saying, I'm making an opening statement, then we would understand what you're doing. Mr. Kaplan didn't either. I thought you would figure that out. I would like to make an opening statement. Okay, please proceed. In fact, Judge Pellegrini expressly held in the second plan appeal that earlier findings in the lower court were not ever binding on BVA and LNR, and that that's an instructive passage to take a look at in the Carlino exhibits. If you look at the Carlino Exhibit 1, Number 5, which is the Pellegrini decision, that's at page 5 and 7. If you look at the last full paragraph of that opinion, the first sentence, the court states, quote, we agree that objectors were the prevailing parties below, period. Because of deficiencies found in the 2014 plan, the board did not approve it, meaning that the developer has no right to develop the property. Close quote. Objectors, I'm sorry, that's not the end of the quote. Objectors argue that they were aggrieved by the trial court's determinations because in any future appeals, objectors will be stopped from raising the issues the trial court decided against them. And here is the critical quote. However, collateral estoppel will not apply to those determinations because those purportedly adverse determinations against the objectors as the prevailing party were not essential to the judgment below. Not essential to the judgment is the key phrase. The developer, and what is the judgment that Judge Pellegrini expressly said in that decision? Quote, that the developers have no right to develop the property. That is the issue before you here in evaluating the plan. Collateral estoppel does not generally apply in zoning, and it applies even less in land development plans. One of the few areas where Mr. Fisher and I expressly agree. In the second plan case, Mr. Fisher made a point in rejecting Mark's earlier motion that with a new plan, we had to evaluate the plan based on the plan before us and not what happened before. Every plan has to meet the current ordinance standards. There are numerous changes in the plan before you now between that and the plan that was most recently rejected by the Commonwealth Court. 
In fact, you've also had amendments to your code of ordinances, some of which apply here. But the bottom line is, as you stated, every plan has to meet applicable ordinances. Now, I'd like to just take one more minute and consider Mark's first point, which was this is the fourth plan. But why have there been three prior plans that have failed to comply with applicable ordinances and have been overturned either by this court or by the court? From the beginning of my involvement in this case, I haven't been in as long as these two, but from the beginning of this case, the first time I looked at this plan, it seemed obvious to me that the problem that existed was that the developer was attempting to put 10 pounds into a five pound bag to overdevelop this site to exceed the carrying capacity of a 10 acre tract for a large development. The general, the, the, the parcel of property is too small for and too constrained for the amount of square footage that this developer seeks to squeeze into this tract. And that is really the overriding issue that clouds this entire case. Your zoning ordinance and your land and uh, subdivision and land development ordinances and your stormwater ordinance is the public policy of this township. We didn't write those ordinances. All we've been doing for the last four plans is pointing out where this plan doesn't meet it. And I think at the end of the day, if you look at all of the tentacles of all of these different issues, they all come back to this 10 pounds into a five pound bag problem. This site is too small and too constrained for the amount of square footage and the amount of design and development that repeatedly gets presented here. If you look, you know, 10 acres is a minimum lot size in the MU district. And it is simply put, a lot of these issues come back to the developer seeking to exceed the carrying capacity of that 10 acres. They're asking for 18, and I guess if you look at, I just read Mark's testimony last night, it's actually 19 waivers. That's an incredible number of waivers from your public policy, which is the ordinances of the township. In addition to the 18 waivers, they want you to inappropriately interpret two zoning ordinance provisions, 399-77B2, where they need to uh, fail to meet the, the plantings, and 399-106B, where they want you to approve porous paving in areas where your ordinance clearly indicates, yeah, you can do porous paving, but that's for overflow. That's for non-employees. And your own engineer said that the porous paving on this plan is right in the middle of the parking lot, right in the area closest to the stores, and it's not overflow. It's not uh, supplementary parking. This plan that's before you now suffers from this same chronic problem. They vote you. This township was voted three times right, to approve, and then one time you. you reversed that approval. I kept asking myself, obviously the township wants a giant food store. Obviously the township wants a connector road. So then the question was, is that possible on this 10-acre track? Mr. Thacker in his testimony in December said, not possible without these 18 waivers. So after that testimony, we asked our engineers, is it possible? Is Mr. Thacker right? And the testimony that we're gonna present briefly, I'm going to go through the report, but we're not gonna read it line by line. I don't wanna do that either, but, okay, as Mr. Scribner has repeatedly said, as Mr. Fisher has uh, said, you aren't engineers. So just sticking a piece of paper under your nose where there's drawings and, and, 
and overlays on the existing ARNA plan mm -hmm. is not sufficient for you guys to figure it out. But Mr. Orr I'm going to make it efficient, please. Okay, but, I'm, but I think the record should state, though, that that, I, that exhibit has many pages of text. So it's not just plans, but go, go forward. I am going to be very efficient. Mr. Thacker was allowed to testify to each of the 18 waivers, and our witnesses are going to be asked to do the exact same thing and follow the exact same protocol. And I would now like I to... I believe, excuse me, Mark. I'm sorry. I believe it is possible, and the LTL report, I think, is going to show that the township can in fact get a giant supermarket and the township can in fact get a connector road. And you can do it in substantial compliance with your saldo, with your zoning ordinance, and with your stormwater ordinance. The problem here is who's driving the train and are we prepared to ignore the law in order to accommodate a developer or can we make the developer do the right thing and I believe that the township is in a position and if the if and, and I'm not trying to be a, a wise guy this is not meant to, to be a, a smart a smart but if they uh, weren't able to see a path clearly as to how they could develop this property and get what everybody says they want the LTL report is going to show them how to do it. With that, I'd like to call my first I, I'd witness. I'd like to uh, voice an objection at, at this time so the board understands where I'm coming from. You have my motion in limine, so I'm not going to repeat all of what was there. I, I, I guess I'll try and make two separate points so this doesn't go on very long. The plan that LTL has prepared is some 15,000 square feet of retail area less than our plan. There will be no testimony that our tenant, Giant, has agreed with that plan. There is no proffer of a financial analysis to show that this plan with 15,000 square feet less is economically viable. So this plan is a fantasy, and it is not, as Gene has said many times, it is not the plan that is in front of you. We went through this the last hearing. Just because you have a blank piece of, of ground and you put something on that property, you draw something, that doesn't mean that it's what the township wanted or dictated with regard to the road, nor does it show that it is what Giant wants, nor does it show that it is economically feasible. With so all due respect, this is final argument. No, no, not, I, you know, I, I am objecting yeah. to I am objecting to the introduction of both the plan, the written material, and the testimony. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. So you're let me restating what's in your motion to eliminate. Okay. But now I so think what you're so saying let me let me go. Assuming that the board accepts your recommendation, Kristen, that the that this uh, presentation, the plan, and the text goes into the record, I object to any testimony for a very specific reason. I just read what Jean gave me a half an hour ago. And what Mr. Ulrich has said in this report, or the five or six pages, he said that, be, that the waivers that we need, that Chirag testified to, we wouldn't need if we adopted their plan. If we adopted their plan, then the waivers we ask for wouldn't be needed. That's not the issue before you. The issue before you is did we justify the waivers for our plan? We have our testimony. What I'm told is, and what I'm shown here, is that 
they're going to proffer a witness who's going to say, I have a different plan, and if I have a different plan, I don't need the waivers that um, Carlino needs. That's not relevant, and even if that testimony were correct, what's it got to do with our plan? So I object to putting the plan in. I, I assume you're gonna, the board's gonna take your recommendation, but therefore I absolutely uh, um, object to testimony about whether or not the new LTL plan needs the waivers that we need or not. This is a rehash of the motion in limine which you've already ruled on and the issue is not that they should adopt this plan. The issue is in the MPC, it's in Mark Kaplan's own letter, which I believe is your board seven. It's 512.1 of the MPC. And it says that in order for the board to <coughs> grant a waiver, a hardship with regard to the property has to be shown. The LTL plan isn't here, go develop it this way. The LTL plan is to show you that there is no hardship, which is directly relevant to the Sharak Thacker testimony that we spent all day on December the 12th listening to, all day long. Mr. Thacker's report was also in beforehand, but Mr. Kaplan got to present that testimony all day long on December 12th. That is what the Ulrich testimony will be about. Nothing more, nothing his, less. His report wasn't on. Hey, his report we, we, wasn't wait, wait a minute. We we did, we've already ruled on the motion. Let's, if you're <coughs> going to do testimony, you said you're going to be brief. Please proceed. John Cropper, please come to the witness stand. May I ask for an offer of proof with regard to what? Um, Certainly you can. Mr. Cropper is the, one of the owners of BVA. He runs Crops Market Fresh. And his testimony, since our property is going to be directly and adversely impacted by this plan and this connector road, if this board approves it, he has every right to be here and to testify. But he's also going to provide some relevant <coughs> testimony to demonstrate that some very fundamental and basic assumptions made by Mr. Heinrich are not factually accurate. Can we please swear? Well, to the extent, hold on, I'm going to say something. The extent he's going to testify about how he thinks he's negatively impacted, I don't think that is relevant. I'm not to the going to extent, ask him those questions. Okay, well that's what you, you just you, you asked what Mr. Orlando, please let me finish. I apologize. Please. Mr. Kaplan asked for an offer of proof. You responded partially and said that part of his testimony was going to talk about how his property is going to be harmed. I don't think that's relevant to the board's determination. The, the second part you said that he's going to bring in evidence relating to re, uh, refuting maybe or ref, what I'm looking for, um, criticizing Heinrich's testimony based on certain assumptions. I think that is relevant, and I think that's what his testimony should be limited to. My testimony is going to be 15 minutes if I'm allowed to present it. Can I please <coughs> come and show? I do. State your full name. John Robert Cropper. Are you one of the owners of Brandywine Village Associates? Yes. Is there currently a food store operating on Brandywine Village Associates property, which is next to the proposed development here? Yes. What's the name of the store? Crops Fresh Marketplace. Are you one of the managers of Crops, uh, Crops Fresh Marketplace? I'm the operating manager. Approximately how many square feet is Crops Fresh Marketplace? Objection. How's that relevant to whether or not our plan complies? It's relevant because the proposal is for a 65,000 square foot shopping center, and we're going to present testimony about trucks in and out on the size shopping center or that we have. It's directly relevant. Please. It's not relevant. By the relevant. time we're done arguing about this, the testimony is going to be over. Please let me present my case. I, I think you should rule on it. it this Please get to how his shopping center somehow is relevant to this to. plan. How many square feet, Mr. Cropper? 51,000, roughly. Were you involved in the original development? Yeah, yes. Were the waters involved in the original development? Yes. Did you participate in the original development? 
Yes, they did. Uh, and I'm going Mr. to object. I think that's the dead man's role. They're both gone. How can he testify about anything hey, in, involving the waters? Hang on. I'll withdraw the objection. Go, go ahead. Let's get this done. Mark, this is going to take a lot shorter. I, I, yeah, I, I know. Go ahead. Please. try to cut to, to the chase here. The, the reason I asked Mr. Cropper about his initial involvement in the participation by the Walters is Mark has expressly argued in this record that the initial uh, DVA development plan was not relevant. Okay, Let, let me explain what, what we're going to do here. This is the only reason I ask you for the question. You'll see in the exhibit books, now it's gonna, I'm going to try to do it very quickly because there's only three questions. If, if Mr. Cropper, you're going to have to use mine. Here, I can share with Mr. Fisher. You can. I'm not. sure? Okay. Okay. Okay, if I stand over here. Can you hear him again? That be a problem. I, I'll, make, I'll be loud. The problem is I'm always too loud because I have a big voice box. <laughs> so, John, and, and again, to, to try to cut to the chase, I'm not, I don't want to testify, but I want to get through this. If you look in the exhibits, you will see a certified copy. In I, item L and R3 is a certified copy in the re of the Recorder of Deeds Plan Book 12551, page 1. That is the recorded plan for Brandywine Village, but it's also the plan that actually establishes and creates the lot that is before this board today on the Carlino land development. It is the original subdivision plan that actually creates this lot. Number one, it's a certified copy, and Mr. Winters has the original with the original certification and a full-size copy of the plan. So just like the board has said before, you can take judicial notice of what's hey. in the public record. Sure. Okay, and it is relevant because it's the actual plan that creates the lot. I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to, to enforce any notes on the plan. That's not the purpose. But that's Board Exhibit 3. Board Exhibit 4. L and R Exhibit. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. L and R 4. Ready? L and R 4. I contacted the Chester County Planning Commission. And I asked them... I contacted the Chester County Planning Commission and I asked them to provide the complete Chester County Planning Commission records with regard to the Brandywine Village Associates development, specifically with the Recorder of Deeds Plan Book 12551, page 1. And we received a certified copy from the Chester County Planning Commission, certified by the county solicitor that what is attached as board exhibit, I'm sorry, LNR exhibit number four is the complete record from the Chester County Planning Commission. Now the reason that's relevant and the reason I asked Mr. Cropper about the participation 
of Mr. and Mrs. Waters is there's a whole thi thing, there's a lot. Speech. This is a speech. Mark, he's just trying to get through it. Let's I'm trying to get through it. The relevance will determine. If you want me to do it through his testimony, How much we stop objecting please go forward. I'll do it through testimony. Go speech. forward. Go, go, go ahead. So, I apologize. So the Chester County Planning Commission gave us their entire record. A lot of what you see here, and this is the record that we requested relative to the recorded subdivision plan, which is LNR 3. In the Chester County Planning Commission, they gave us the, the plans they reviewed, review letters. There's a whole series of things. I put the whole thing in so that you would see that the entire record that we asked for relative to that recorded plan. But the, re but the issue relevant to Mr. Cropper's question that I just asked him is, if you flip, there is a sheet that looks like this. It, it has, uh, it looks like this. There's a sheet in there that looks like this. If you flip. What I didn't see. It I'm sorry, Mark. Like what number does that say? What, can you read that? It says in-house 8569-2-1989. That's the, those numbers, and the, 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 that's, that's the Chester County Planning Commission, how they index this information. And again, you don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm, I'm trying to make it relevant and quick. If you look through here, you will see numerous letters and numerous applications where Frank and Beatrice Waters are listed as the applicants on this plan, contrary to Mark's argument that they had nothing to do with it. Last but not least, if you look at LNR Exhibit 5, you will see a certified copy of the highway occupancy permit for the Brandywine Village Shopping Center and if you look, and again, Mr. Winters has the original certification. Every certification has an original seal from the public agency that produced it. And if you look at board exhibit number B5, a certified copy of the HOP for Brandywine Village Shopping Center, you will note that Frank and Beatrice Waters were the applicants. Frank and Beatrice Waters got the right in and right out for us they got the signalized intersection, which is there today. They got all the stormwater improvements along North Guthriesville Road, and they got the HOP for North Guthriesville Road rear entrance. Okay. Contrary, and again, with all due respect to Mark, he argued that it's not relevant, Waters had nothing to do with it, the plan doesn't have anything to do with them, and bottom line is the public records show otherwise. My only point in asking Mr. Cropper whether they were involved was to lay the foundation to demonstrate that these public records demonstrate that the Mr. and Mrs. Waters were well aware of that plan and well aware of the constraints placed on it and well aware of the conditions on the plan. I'm not asking you to enforce conditions. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is for you to take judicial notice of existing public records and the participation of the predecessors entitled to this plan. That's all it is. That's all it's about. I, and I can move on to other questions for Mr. Cropper that are beyond this. I, 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 after that long speech, I'll try and make it short. In prior hearings, we had Mr. Ulrich testify with regard to the actual approved plan for Brandywine Village Associates. I have that plan here. In that testimony, I asked Mr. Ulrich, I said, show me on this plan where the waters signed this plan and therefore would be bound by this plan. And he couldn't show it to us. The plan, the, the, that recorded plan does not show the waters signature. The fact that BVA spent, and we know they spent four years getting the approvals. They've introduced two different, two different uh, versions of the deed restriction. The fact that the Waters might have been the applicant for a highway occupancy permit while they owned the property, it is, doesn't change anything 
with regard to what's what's really relevant about the the plan i still don't i i guess i still don't understand what I, is I, the point I, I, even if you accept that they might have been involved somehow while they were still the owners Kaplan, of isn't this really argument can't you keep well, this until the final make well, a note you can make for that part of your final I, argument. I, I i just i object to the testimony mr fisher that's that's my point yes we don't, let's just go forward with the testimony please can we try our hardest to get through factual testimony we will give each party an opportunity to prepare findings of fact, conclusions of law, and legal arguments before the board renders a decision. So to the extent you believe any of this is relevant, you can argue that, and you can have a chance to rebut that. I think that we're trying to get through these hearings. Please proceed, Mr. Orlando. Excuse me, Madam Solicitor. This is the third time I've raised my hand asking to comment on an objection in the matter, and you've ignored me. I'll be very quick. Mr. And very Prince, quick. I haven't seen you raise your hand yet. So the record should reflect but, I've not seen you raise your hand. But this then is you the haven't been time. looking at me. Well, so I'm let sorry. Me There's proceed. a lot of things going May on. May I proceed? I'll make it very quick. She already as you said, it. As you said, in terms of taking judicial notice, you also need to take judicial notice of this board's decisions on three occasions when it reviewed this plan, BVA's plan, the plan that we're talking about right now. Three times you reviewed it, three times you approved it, and on three occasions that plan was not challenged by anyone. As Mr. Kaplan knows, the law is that when a plan is submitted and the plan is approved by this board, if it is not challenged, it becomes a binding yeah. approved plan and it was recorded as such. End of argument about whether or not the waters participated. Now, Mr. Proper, two very quick questions. The period of time relative to the certified copies I presented there, what, what years, what periods of time co were covered by that period? Uh, we started in 1989 and it was 94 or so when we finished up. And during that period of time, were the waters participating? Yes, very much. Now, you said that you're the manager of crops of uh, Market fresh, correct? That's correct. And are you familiar generally with the proposed land development plan and the proposed connector? Yes, I am. And if that plan is approved, will Crops Fresh Marketplace have to uh, have its customers and its vendors access the property by virtue of that connector? Yes. And I want you to. Please turn to LNR Exhibit 7. And can you tell us what LNR Exhibit 7 is? Exhibit 7 is a list of uh, an average week of trucks uh, deliveries to our market existing now. Who are at your direction uh, gather this data with regard to the actual truck traffic concerning crops fresh marketplace yes we did and can you please just walk us through the report uh, how many tractor trailers uh, on a normal week does crop fresh marketplace uh, have? okay the numbers we gathered there's 22 tractor trailers per week and 85 street trucks per week. And that's on every week, correct? That, that would be an average week. Uh, holidays, there'd be more. You, what do you mean by on holidays, there'd be more? When we pick up extra volume, it gets busier at holidays, so you get more deliveries. Okay. So, the. And, and again, did you say the number of tractor trailers? 22. Every week? Every week, yes. And other deliveries, total trucks that aren't tractor trailers, but that are delivery trucks? That was 85. Were you, were you here when Mr. Heinrich testified that in his report, when he referred to an occasional truck, that he was basing that on the 
developer's testimony that their delivery is going to be one tractor trailer every other day? Yes, I believe I was. Is that realistic? No. Cross-examined. Um, Mr. Cropper, let me just understand um, when you actually purchased the property. When did you actually close on the property that you bought from the waters? Uh, we had an agreement of sale as we progressed through the whole development process. Uh, I guess the final was, I don't know for sure, 94 or so is when we finally sat down. 90, it could be 93, I'm not, I don't recollect. I, I, that's my recollection. You yeah. started in 1989. 1989. And um, you spent all of that time getting the approvals, correct? That's correct. And, and during the time that you didn't own the property, um, the waters had to be the uh, applicant on the highway occupancy permit because they owned the property. Isn't that true? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Orlando asked you about access, and uh, I have a copy of your Plans prepared, plan of subdivision for Brandywine Village, and the uh, this is already in the record. And also the land development plans. Not that that wrong. This is this was not signed. The, the, the actual recorded plan, Mr. Winter had right here. Oh. Okay. So you're this saying was, it's this was it's signed. This was I, I this was approved by this board on April 4, 1994. Correct. Did you see that here? And the date is, yes, that's correct, the date. Can I ask a question, please? Is the plan that you're showing him the same plan that Gene produced as LNR 3? Right. I'd rather do that. Well, I think I the I issue is if you're going to continue with that plan, you're going to have to mark it and make it an exhibit. Otherwise, you have to use the plan. You can use the plan that's already been made an LNR 3. What I understand is what I thought. This is just the subdivision plan. So it shows the development on the property. It doesn't show the driveways on the property. I, I did see, at least in my copy, that it's uh, page one of seven or page one of eight, and they're not the, the additional pages. I don't know if the additional pages were recorded or not. Okay, so I'm up to Carlino 5. I don't know if your records reflect that. The last Carlino exhibit was Resolution 14 of 2014. So uh, this would be Car put this, this would be Carlino 6. Yeah. Okay, so this is Carlino 6. Please tell us what Carlino Scott, 6 is. I'd appreciate it if you come over here and look at this plan with me. The plan I'm looking at is sheet two of eight of the Edward B. Walsh and Associates, Inc. plan dated 10-27-93 with revision dates through 12-7-93. Is that, if I accurately identified that plan? That's what it says, yes. Okay. So on this plan, if you're coming east to west from Downingtown and you're a truck, don't you get to this right in, right out driveway first? If you're coming from that direction, correct. Yeah. And, and if you can come from that direction, you have a clear pathway right through the shopping center to go around to the back of the food market, don't you? Uh, the tractor trailers wouldn't proceed that way because they couldn't back up. They would go across the front and around this way. So they, excuse me, 
Get, get out of my space, please. I'm not in your space. Yeah, I, gentlemen, this is not romper room. Act your ages and let's get through this. Mr. Prince, please give him his space to do this. This is crazy. Mr. Chairman, I'm not doing the right job looking at Let him have his time at the podium, please. So the truck's coming west to east. I'm sorry, east to west. Come in, make a right turn in the right in the uh, right in entrance, come down in front of your food store, come down, make a left in front of your food store, and then make a right and go around the back. That's correct. Okay. And um, when you did your calculations of the number of tractor trailers that come in a week, did you determine how many of them come from the east and how many come from the west? No, we did not. And isn't it true that um, Strike that. I have no further questions. So we could just we could just take this one sheet and identify this one sheet for for the record. Okay, what sheet is it? It's sheet two of eight. And I'll be glad to make more copies of this so that I can keep my whole set. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions for Mr. Cropper. You're in my space. You want to move your finish with Mr. Cropper. You said. Gentlemen, please. Lessons took us. It's good for Schmeissel. I have no idea. If you were in a courtroom, you wouldn't be standing over the other lawyer and the witness. So that's. I think that's all we're trying to do is keep a decorum here. I just have a simple question. The plan, there was a reference to an April of 94. Was that with regard to this plan? Which was all I was trying to determine, Mr. Schreiner, because who, who are you this asking? particular Why are you asking the board that you have a witness here? Well, They're I, not your witnesses. If, if he can answer a question you have, fine. Otherwise, sit down. Madam Solicitor, you, you admitted an exhibit. I haven't and admitted it. I'm trying any. to determine what it is that's Mr. So Prince, hard. but you you have a witness here. That is who you may ask a question to. You can't look to the board and ask them a question on a on an exhibit that they didn't bring into this case. Mr. Prince? I do not. Mr. Orlando, do you have redirect? No. No redirect. Thank okay. you. Please call your next witness. Roll. I see that you have his uh, curriculum vitae marked as an exhibit. Can we stipulate that he is an expert in is it civil engineering, Mr. Orlando, that you would be offering him? I am offering him as an expert and as a licensed professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. His CV LNR is two. shown as LNR2. Right. Mr. Kaplan, can Kaplan? we stipulate to that, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Please proceed. Can you please have Mr. Ulrich sworn? One, two. Please state your full name and your business attitude. This one, which is not the full name. My full name, Norman A. Ulrich III, and uh, address of uh, my work is uh, One Town Center Drive, Oli, PA, 19547. I work at LTL Consultants. You are a licensed professional engineer? In That's correct. Pennsylvania? That's correct. And LNR, LNR Exhibit 2 is a copy of your curriculum vitae, correct? <coughs> yeah. 
Yes, it is. Okay, now, did you have the opportunity to examine the Carlino plan prepared by Arn Engineering? That's the subject of this hearing. Yes, I did. And you reviewed that plan and made comments in a letter dated November 1st, 1918, which I believe is Board Exhibit 28? Uh, dated 2018. I'm sorry, did I say something else? 1918. Yeah. That, that, would, that would have been a neat trip. Sorry about that. Uh, not looking so good today, but not that bad. The first 2018 is... Correct. Correct. What exhibit did you say? Gene, Gene, what board exhibit did you say it was? It was tw uh, B28. Thank you. And Mr. Robert, we're not going to review B28, but I do need you to take a look at B28 for just a minute so that I can ask you... There's a, there's a blue packet right there I was intending for the witness oh, to be able to use. Thank you. Just quickly look, please, at B28. Okay, okay. Yes. Now, here's my only question. Do the opinions that you expressed in B28 rendered to the reasonable and certain degree of engineering certainty as of the date and time that you issued that report? Yes, it is. Were you present on December the 12th when Mr. Thacker, the developer's engineer, testified about the 18 waivers that the developer is requesting for this plan? Uh, again, I believe it was 19, but yes. And if you would please turn to board exhibit B3, which is, I believe, the developer's plan. And if you can uh, turn to sheet two of 34 in B3. Oh. I'm sorry, sheet number again? Two of 32. Okay. Do you agree that that's the existing conditions? Uh, on the property with regard to uh, structures and improvements? Um, no, I don't believe that's an existing conditions plan. Well, I, I, I'm used to seeing contours on it. It's labeled as a conservation plan. Okay. Mr. Be Thacker indicated in his testimony that uh, other than the Brandywine Village entrance uh, and the storm water that there was nothing else on the property. Is that your understanding as well? Yes, I would agree with that. Were you, are you familiar with the declaration of taking that was employed by the township relative to the plan that's in front of us today? Yes, I have reviewed that. And with the existing the existing BVA access from Route 322, was that included in that condemnation to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it was. Is the proposed Carlino entrance, well, no, strike that. If you take a look, I think our exhibits are there. Um, if you could flip to LNR 8. I do. Okay. Can you tell us? Uh, it says sheet five of 34. That's the ARNA plan, correct? Yes, it is. And does that, do you recognize that that shows the proposed configuration for the connector road that the developer wants to construct? Yes, I do. Can you tell us what the yellow highlighted area is that's shown? on LNR 8. 
Uh, the yellow highlighted area looks to represent the existing uh, BVA entrance. So is, am I correct then that the yellow highlighted area is the existing BVA entrance that's not included in the proposed connector there? That, that's correct, yes. Okay. Now. Let me show you what I had marked as LNR 9. And I think uh, Attorney Camp has marked it as a board exhibit as well. But if, if yeah, it's someone it's the, uh, uh, LNR 9 exhibit. Okay, I don't have anything in. The on the table here. It's okay. This. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So it's a large okay. report, yes, okay. It's this, Gene, right? Yes, it's a big report. Okay. Yeah, I just put it I put I put it in a binder. Please tell us what LNR nine is, Mr. Orr. Uh that LNR nine report is a report that uh, LTL was directed to uh, prepare that shows a, a connector road uh, alignment and some other design issues that would uh, substantially reduce the uh, waivers that would be necessary that were requested. But does the LNR 9 review the existing waivers and waiver testimony from Mr. Thacker? Yes, it does. Okay. And I see, and again, the board can read, I don't want, I don't want to read the report, but I do want to make sure that what is presented is clearly explained and as efficiently as we can. The assumptions in terms of uh, your preparation of this design are noted on the first page. I want to focus, if you can, on hitting each waiver that was presented in testimony. And well, first of all, before we do that, because I think I can do this more efficiently if we do, uh, if we get. Uh, identified LNR 10. So can you take a look at LNR 10 and let's get that identified so that we can try to hit all the waivers in order without um, doing them twice? Yes. Can you tell us what LNR 10 is? Um, LNR 10 uh, is essentially a supplement to the uh, the previous, the LNR 9, which addresses, addressed some information that was not provided in LNR 9, which was the, the previous report. Now Additional I, information. I, because we, we, you just completed this yesterday and we just handed it out this morning, I do want to take one minute and look at the first paragraph of LNR 10. I want you to take a look and, and read that to yourself for a minute. Actually, read the first two paragraphs. They're pretty short. Okay. So, am I correct? And again, not to uh, to lead you, but just to move it forward. LNR ten does not provide additional issues on waivers, it supplements LNR 9 in, in terms of providing more detail for the waivers already presented. That is correct. Is that an accurate characterization? Yes, I would say that it is. Okay, now do you have the board book in front of you before we, uh, there's been some question about this. If you can open the board 7. Okay. Well, do you have board seven in front of you? The Kaplan letter of November 16th? Yes, I do. I do want you to read just one, the very bottom part where it says section 512.1. Objection. 
Why does he need to read this? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because one member of the board, the solicitor for the board, and you have argued that issues regarding the land and physical issues on the land are not relevant to this proceeding. And all I'm trying to do for the rest of our testimony is to put it into the context of the MPC section, which you have cited. That's oral, it's, it's legal argument. Not only that, we, we have and the board will have guided on the, the law on waiver. So it's in this letter, he cites the MPC section. So he, he can say, can I, have you read this letter? Do you understand that? Simple. That's it. That is have you read this letter and do you understand those two sections Let me relate to waivers? Own, my own word is clear. Yes, yes. Do you believe that that's the MPC standard for determining hardship and waivers? Yes, I do. Now, if you, again, looking at board exhibit um, three, which is sheet two of 34, Mr. Thacker. Wait, wait, wait. Wh which? which board I exhibit three, sheet two of 34, is that correct? That's what I said, yeah. Okay. Which I think Mr. Thacker indicated that, that his opinion was that was the existing conditions plan. So all I want you to do is, is your view that is there anything on the property or shown on that plan that would prevent the design of a development including a roadway uh, which could comply with township subdivision ordinance? No, I don't. And it's not relevant to this application. That's not and the criteria. Which is well, exactly. He's already answered it. So we'll apply the appropriate criteria when the board renders its decision. Please proceed. Now, if you would uh, look at Eleanor nine. like to try to do the waiver provisions and make sure that the exhibits to LNR 9 are clearly defined. So the, am I correct, Mr. Ulrich, that the first waiver provision that you reviewed is at the bottom of page two of LNR nine. That is correct. And it's section 350.24.B paren three little i. That is correct. And uh, that's the one about three information in 300 feet and you don't have any comment about that different than ARNA, right? No, we were not. We did not receive direction to do anything about that. No. If you look at the top of page three of Eleanor nine, what's that section? That is uh, section three fifty point twenty four point B point three point parenthesis little o. And that's the shadow analysis that Mr. Thacker testified about, correct? Correct. And you don't have any issue with uh, what Mr. Thacker indicated with regard to that request for a waiver? No, I do not. Now, take a look at number three. What's number three? Uh, number three is section 350.34 paren capital E, and that deals with a, a, a vertical alignment issue regarding intersections and a percentage of grade. And uh, in this case, we, we agree with uh, Arna's uh, testimony that we don't believe that it applies as the judge had indicated. So we, we don't have any issue with. But they, they still have asked 
for a waiver. And let me be clear, because I think you showed this on one of the attachments to LNR 9, and that's one of the things I want to hit briefly. That involves the proposed Carlino right turn out onto 322, correct? It involves that, but we don't believe it applies to that. Okay. But with regard to that right turn out, I believe Mr. Thacker also testified that they couldn't quite meet the percentage slope. Can they, in fact, meet the percentage slope? Yes, we believe they can. And is that reflected anywhere on your plan? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Is that reflected? I said, is that reflected anywhere on the attachments to LNR 9? Objection. If you just said it wasn't relevant, he doesn't interpret it in a way that is relevant, why are we getting into whether your plan meets it or not? Because it's still a waiver that they have requested. They asked for it in the alternative. I don't care what their alternative is. If it's before this board, my witness can comment on it. But I think I have another reason for the objection. I want the record to clearly indicate that when Mr. Ulrich says that they could meet it, meaning Carlino could meet it, he's referring to a plan that he prepared that is a different plan from ours. This is the motion in limine. No, I just want to make sure. You're not being clear, Gene. I'm not trying to do anything. You ask him whether they could meet that requirement, and you had him say yes because it's shown on his plan. And all I'm saying is that his plan is a different plan than our plan. Can't we agree on that? Okay. I was trying to do the waivers to try to be efficient. Okay. I'll address it. So now, Mr. Kaplan, you asked for it. Mr. Ulrich, please. No, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I was trying to do the waivers by numbers. I didn't do anything different. Gentlemen, continue on the way that you were going. We're not going to rehash this in a different direction. I don't want to rehash. Okay. Okay. But he's raising an issue with the plan, so now please turn to sheet one. And we're not going to start reading through this now either at this point. No, we're not. We're going to identify every change on the ARNA plan that is relevant to the waivers. Mr. Ulrich. What is that? This is exactly what I objected to. These two documents that Mr. I'm objecting to this line of testimony because Mr. Orlando keeps saying he's not going to repeat everything, and then that's exactly what he's doing. These two exhibits, 9 and 10, really speak for themselves. He, Mr. Ulrich, has prepared this other plan, and he's then looked at the waiver that we requested, the 18 waivers, and he has said that on his plan those 18 waivers aren't needed. For some of them. What? For some of them. Oh, I'm sorry. And some of them are. Right. So I agree. And that's you believe it's relevant. The board has it. Why do you need him to sit here and go through every single one and restate what he wrote? That's what I'm not understanding, and that's what we were trying to avoid. I have so far not asked him to restate anything. You are. You're going through 1 and 2 and 3, and you're asking him to basically summarize what's in bold. Madam Solicitor, I guess the question I have is you allowed Mr. Thakkar to opine at length all day why particular waivers were necessary, even though you had before you not one, not two, but three reports from Mr. Thakkar. They weren't reports. They were letters. May I finish, please, without interruption? I'd rather just go forward. Let's stop the arguments. Go forward with your testimony. Let's just go. Bring it in. The record reflects. So he won the battle. The board will decide what we listen to on this and not, and if it gets to be redundant, we're going to end it real quick. Continue. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ulrich, please look at the first plan attachment to LNR 9. Okay. Am I correct that that's sheet 5 of 34 of the Arnold plan? 
Yes. And what information has LTL added to that plan? It's, it's, first of all, it's, it's at the very end of your narrative on LNR 9, right? The first sheet after the end of the yes, narrative? Yes, it's a, a pull-out 11 by 7 sheet uh, directly after the last page of the, the letter. Okay. Please tell the board what information was added by LTL to this ARNA plan. Okay. The... Uh, the plan that Mr. Orlando was referring to is sheet 5 of 34 of the ARNA plan, and that uh, LTL had imposed an image on top of that, and the, uh, the intention of that image was to show how the connector road could be uh, designed or could be laid in there to avoid the majority of the waivers that the ARNA plan is, is requesting. Are the black lines, which show the outline of a realigned connector road, some of the information provided by LTL on this plan? That is correct. That is correct. And the, is, there's a blue hatched area to the northwest of the black lined connector road. Can you identify what that is? Uh, yes, that, that, it's labeled as condemned land not required. It's roughly uh, two-thirds of an acre, and it's the area that with the, the realignment and aligning the uh, northern portion of the connector road with uh, Quail Lane there, uh, it would not be necessary from a uh, condemnation standpoint. And the blue information, the items that are typed in blue, are they additions by LTL on this plan as a result of this reconfiguration concerning the result of that road alignment? Yes, they are. And does it address issues relevant to the waivers and show changes as a result of this suggested alignment? that would be reflected in the blue information that's uh, superimposed on this ARNA plan. Yes. This is exactly and what we said we weren't going to do. I, I object. This is exactly what... How many times are you going to allow him to make the same objection? Please. This is the same objection over and over and over. If it, I'm allowed to present my case, we're going to be out of here by lunchtime. Okay, please proceed. Objection is noted. Mr. Ulrich, please flip to sheet two. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, the, the second plan pullout on LNR 9. Tell us what, what that is, and because this is a little different than the blue information on sheet one. Please explain. Sheet two. Uh, sheet two shows, uh, in large part, the uh, the grading that is a result of the realignment of the connector road, and probably more so the associated stormwater modifications that also uh, are addressed in the letter portion, where there are um, discussions about uh, stormwater waivers that are being requested. And the reconfiguration of the stormwater, which Mr. Thacker directly testified was related to where he had to put the road. These are consistent with LTL's uh, analysis of the waivers with regard to the uh, no, pro no issue on the property that would prevent this redesign. Yes. All right, please look at the third plan sheet, which again is uh, different than the ARNA plan, but uses the ARNA plan as a base. Please tell us what sheet three shows. Okay, sheet three is primarily showing 
the surface area that is being captured by the different stormwater features, Basin 1 as it's labeled there in blue, Basin 2 as it's labeled in green, Basin 3 as it is labeled in yellow, and then also your RG123, um, those are uh, BMP features. Um, this also shows, well, it, that answers your question. All right, now, there were a number of waivers to turning movements into the BVA property that the developer is seeking that affect access, ingress and egress to BVA's property. And uh, waivers are related to some of those turning movements. Behind the three plan sheets in LNR 9 that we've just looked at, can you tell us what the those are and what information it provides that is not specifically narrated in your report. Okay. Um, what exhibits, and if you'd allow me, one through seven, what they show is they show an illustration, and the part that's helpful about these exhibits is it kind of, it shows in blue and in red, the red being the center line of the truck turning movement, the blue being the the outer, let's say, bumpers or corners of the particular turning movement for the WB67 as it makes those movements. And what it, what really can't be shown very well in, in text that you can see here is the, the actual movement to show that the, the horizontal realignment of the connector road as presented in LNR9 uh, shows that those movements now can be made in a, a safe manner uh, for public health, safety, welfare kind of uh, an issue. So are those, the, these, these truck turn templates, are these actual truck turn templates that would be used by a traffic engineer to verify turning movements on uh, intersections and curves and design, am I correct? Yes, they were, be, they were done by TurnCAD software, which is standard operating procedure. And do those turning templates exhibit one through seven show that design trucks can make every turning movement that's shown on the proposed uh, uh, layout of the, uh, that you've shown in plans one, two, and three? Yes, we, it's been a, a long going issue and, and what these do is they show with that horizontal alignment that the, the turning movements that were previously a concern, they can be made now safely. And they can also, can, uh, and the truck, the radii, which Mr. Thacker indicated was required to be uh, reduced on, into two places that affect BVA and LNR, those are eliminated as concerns in this configuration, am I correct? Uh, radii being reduced, could you restate, I'm not quite following you, what specifically? Yeah. Mr. Thacker said that he couldn't, that the ordinance requires 30 foot radii, he couldn't make 30 foot radii for turn into the rear entrance of BVA and a turn out to the north from BVA onto the connector road. Am I correct that the radii can be made with the road realignment as LTL has shown? Uh, yes, it does. You, if you go back to the first 11 by 17 uh, drawing there and pull that out, uh, the one we first started talking about, it's, it's illustrated and it's called out there in areas where it was deficient prior. It now, with the road realignment, it provides more space between the BVA property line and the, the current alignment so that those radiuses could now meet the ordinance requirements. Okay, now while we're on that plan of number one, in the middle of what is presently the Crops Fresh Marketplace, there's a 750R and an arrow. What does that mean? Uh, 750R stands for 750 foot radius, and uh, one of the waivers that were being requested was for uh, to not comply with the requirement of, of the uh, 
the ordinance of 750 feet, and that 750 foot radius now goes from Quail Hill Lane uh, in a s south westerly direction to a point where it is tangent and perpendicular to Horseshoe Pike. So there's essentially one curve to a tangent section going perpendicularly into Horseshoe Pike now with this particular alignment. And with this particular alignment, does that alignment meet the East Brandywine Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance? It does. And there is also an alignment of this road that now shows that it lines up with Quail Hill Lane. Is that correct? Yes. And does that alignment meet the East Brandywine Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance? Yes, it does. I'd like to point one thing out if I could. Uh, note that it does align, the center of the uh, northern portion of the connector road does align with the center line of Quail. Is it Quail Hill? <laughs> Quail Hill Lane, I Quail think. Hill Lane, I, I can't read. Quail Hill Lane, but you will notice that it says 85 degrees, so it's not coming in perpendicular because there would be an issue with uh, clipping the cor corner of the BVA property. However, the ordinance does permit up to, I think, like 60 degrees, and, and five degrees is, is uh, fairly uh, minimal. Do the center lines of, of the proposed alignment and Quail Hill Lane line up? Yes, they do. Now, you also, on that sheet one of that plan, it says at the south southerly portion at the intersection of Route 322, 42 feet of additional deceleration lane. Quickly tell us what you're talking about there. Um, from the existing condition, this alignment, because it is the intersection with Horseshoe Pike is shifted to the southwest. It shifts away, increasing the deceleration or turn lane to the extent that it now complies with the township's ordinance. There's enough room there for a vehicle traveling at the posted speed limit to either stop in a stop condition safely or make that turning movement for one of two reasons. To, to slow down, to merge with traffic, if they, depending on what movement they're trying to make, or um, there is a crosswalk there, a pedestrian crosswalk that's shown, and that's another very uh, important concern from a pedestrian uh, crosswalk standpoint. It allows for enough room to stop at that condition uh, location as well. Now, if we go back, we can leave the plan sheet sticking out, but if we go back to the narrative Comment. I believe I'm on page three of LNR nine. Okay. Item number four, section three fifty point forty point C. I'm in LNR nine. One in your binder now. Yeah, no, I have my, I want to stay focused on the request and the uh, existence of a hardship. Is there any hardship with regard to the property as stated in uh, MPC section 512.1 that stops a design that, elim that uh, could eliminate the waiver that the developer has asked for under 350.40C. No. And is that what L is that what the LTL configuration shows on these plan sheets that we've been looking at. Again, on the first pullout sheet, the 11 by 17, if you see kind of in the, the bottom center, right there along Horseshoe Pike, you'll see a 30-foot radius. Uh, the issue for the waiver was, uh, I believe, Arna's plan had a 25-foot radius, and there was a, a great associated grading issue with that. 
well, the 30-foot radius from a horizontal standpoint will now work. And then, um, yes, on the following pullout, the 11 by 17, where the grading is shown, that shows how the grading could be adjusted in that general location to comply with the ordinance and uh, no need for a waiver. All right, so num let's move to number five, please. Section 350.40, N as in Nancy, paren two. This is the radio. Correct. They sought waiver requests at two different locations, both of which affect BBA. How does, is there anything on the property that prevents the design of a roadway to eliminate those waivers? Uh, no, there's not. And again, if you look at the 11 by 17, the first pullout sheet, it shows uh, actually um, a 30-foot radius at the most northern corner of the BVA, the back entrance, and then down farther at the main entrance, you'll see a 50-foot radius. The reason for that is that was increased for uh, truck turning movements. So 30-foot would satisfy the minimum, 50-foot it was increased to make sure that the uh, turning movements would could be done. And again, not to belabor it, but all the truck, in this alignment, all truck turning templates work. That is correct. So it is possible then to design a roadway that does not need 350, a waiver from 350.40.N2 on this property. That is correct. All right, let's go to number six. Would it help if I stipulated that no. I should go each, for each one of these, it's going to say the same thing that based on his plan, we wouldn't need the waivers that we've got, we need that we've requested. It, but the, 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 the whole, there's a fallacy in that whole argument. We're not I'm saying not. you need to develop this property the way this plan shows. The issue in the MPC, which is I've been trying to say, and in which you put in your own exhibit, says that the, in order for this board to grant a waiver, there needs to be demonstrated some substantial hardship with regard to the property itself that prevents the compliance with it. And that is the point of this plan. So you I, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to cut it down. I understand that we have differences with regard to the legal position. I understand it's, that. It's I not. Want, just give me one second. Just give me one second. I, I, Mr. Ulrich is going to go through each one of our waivers, and he's going to say, based on this yeah, different this plan, plan this different we plan. wouldn't yeah. need that waiver. I understand where you're going. I think we all it's, understand. It's not the plan. We're not proposing that you develop it this way. We, we understand that. Your, his testimony is. But wait, okay, because here's the issue that's going to come up when there's an appeal regardless of who appeals, regardless of what decision this board makes. The, the issue is going to be, and it has been raised by Mark in every appeal, the issue is it's not in the record. The issue is it's not presented. The issue is on, on the township and the condemnation action that, that our witness did not testify to a reasonable degree of engineering certainty. I have to make this record. I can make it very efficiently. I'm going to be done. But Mr. By Romano, noon. can I ask a question? Aren't you just having him go through LNR nine and ten? Isn't he just reiterating what's in writing here? Yeah, and, we, and if we all agreed that this is authentic, which and that he would testify with a reasonable degree of engineering certainty that this is his this is his testimony. We all will stipulate to that. Does that do what you need? No. I don't think it What does. else are you adding then? I mean, you're, you, right now you've just basically re reiterated. You're having him reiterate what he wrote, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Or more importantly, is there one question on, on all of these 18 that you have a uh, higher priority to rather than three to four questions on all 18? Yes, I can do that, but bear in mind you, you, what you're doing when you try to limit us because you allowed Mr. Thacker to go all day long on December the 12th for each and every one. But his, it's different. Give me a second to say why it's different. His correspondence, there was no other written document 
where he explained the basis for the waiver. You have a wit written document. No, there wasn't. They, they said what the waiver requested was, but they didn't explain the legal justice. They didn't have, there was no written document that I understood where their engineer went through the st legal standard for a waiver and it explained in detail why the waiver was or wasn't needed. You have a very detailed report that explains why your engineer believes, based on a plan they prepared, and then also based on, you know, the, the, then you're asking them to take the jump to say that based on the plan that the applicant prepared, why a waiver is not needed. He has a very detailed report that does that. Madam so that's why I'm not understanding what additional testimony you're getting out from him. Madam I'm Solicitor. asking a question to Mr. Orlando, who's presenting the, the, the piece of evidence here. Is that, I mean, what else are you asking him other than to restate what's in LNR 9? You haven't really done that yet. All I'm trying to do is to present my testimony as I believe I'm required to present in order to protect my client's interest in any appeal if this board grants the approval. See, I'm just asking and a simple question. Are you going to ask him anything other than what he wrote in his report? Just to answer that question. I'm asking him to explain the details of his report that affect engineering issues and whether or not there is substantive physical problems with the property, which is what the MPC says we are entitled to present. I don't know how else to say it. That's I'm willing to stipulate to every question. Each one of you dummies. That's what he's going to say. That based on the we understand that, but he will argue on appeal that we didn't give him due process rights, so please proceed. Uh, Madam, Solicitor, Madam Solicitor, your statement of fact and law with regard to Mr. Thakar's statements was incorrect. Number one, Mr. Thakar submitted at least three written requests for waivers that detail the need for a waiver and why he believed the waiver was appropriate. The statute, the MPC, assuming we care about the objection. Me, Mr. Mr. Thakar, you no, I object to this speech making. You ruled on the objection. And, the, and, and Mr. Prince just wants to prove that he's smarter than, than the solicitor is. Please, let's move on. Agreed. Mr. Orlando, please Agreed. proceed. Agreed. I don't know why I'm not allowed to finish a comment without interruption. But Mr. You're not you, you started witness. out making an objection. The objection's moot because it was overruled, so Mr. Orlando can proceed. Very simple. Well, Mr. Fisher, I think it's just more evidence of your bias and yeah. prejudice. Okay. The statement was not legally or factually correct. Doesn't I'm matter. Right. Continue, Mr. Right. Orlando, That's please. Mr. Roller? I assume those things don't matter. <laughs> please look at number eight. Okay. Street trees. Mr. Thakar said there was no room for street trees. Now, in LNR 9, you believe that that would not be required, but you didn't actually have a chance to look at it, correct? Not as of LNR 9, that's correct. So now please look at LNR 10. Okay. Okay. And as LNR 10 indicated, and I think the board already looked, we thought this testimony was going to be presented on January 22nd. When it wasn't, you had additional time to now drill into the details to confirm your original belief. So please look at LNR 10. Is there any data or plan with regard to LNR 10 that addresses in further detail this statement in LNR 9 that you did not believe a waiver would be required? Yes, there is. Um, in get to it and explain it as quickly as you can. Yes. In LNR 9, uh, again, there wasn't sufficient time to uh, address this in detail, so a, a statement was made, LNR 10, and the purpose of LNR 10 was to further support that. Uh, if you look at LNR 10, the first sheet at the bottom there, comment 8, it talks about the street trees and um, what you will see to support the assertion there that, that it could be done is if you look at the first 
11 by 17 pull out labeled uh, street tree plan, which again is an LNR plan. Sheet 5 of 34 with LTL imagery superimposed on top of that layout. And you will see there in green essentially street trees that now can be located outside of the right of way because sufficient space has been provided and that layout would be consistent with the ordinance. So, am I correct that in LNR 10, you have a pull out sheet? Is the, it says street tree plan in blue. Is that you added that or was that? A, 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 uh, an ARNA addition. We added it, the street trees in green. Okay, and, and but the words street tree plan. So this is, that's uh, that's an addition by LTL. That's correct. And does this actually confirm your belief in LNR nine that a waiver would not be required from 350-54B? It does. Okay, please. Item 10. Yes. This is an LNR 9. Does the grading plan, which is the second 11 by 17 in LNR 9, and the third sheet in LNR 9? Do those plans graphically demonstrate the ability to avoid that waiver on this property? Yes, it does. So Just so that we're clear, did LTL, in examining these waivers to evaluate hardship, actually do the detailed stormwater calculations to support the opinions that are shown in this narrative? It, we, did, we did not in LNR 9, we did in LNR 10. I, I, I lost track as to which one okay. we were talking about. But Mike, with regard to stormwater questions. Correct. I just want to confirm, LTL actually calculated stormwater flows to confirm the ability to avoid waivers on this property. That's correct. And the data that is not the narrative and not the plans and not the turning templates that you already testified to. In both LNR 9 and 10, those demonstrate the, the results and the bases for that data. That's correct? That is correct. And that was done all to a reasonable degree of engineering certainty? Yes. And in compliance with East Brandywine Township ordinances? In large part. There were some that were still, as we're going through, that were not but complied But they were with. noted in your report. That's correct. That they yes. Did not, correct? That's correct. So to the extent that they're not noted, they comply with the ordinances? That's correct. Okay, so now let's go to 11, which is the requested waiver of 345-311-B10. In LNR 9, you believe that a waiver would not be required, but you did not address the pipe design. Am I correct? That is correct. But you did in LNR 10, correct? That is correct. Okay, well, it says please go through that as efficiently as we can. Is that referenced in LNR 10, and if so, where and how? In LNR 10, you'll notice that under comment 11, uh, which is on the second page, there's additional text that, that does explain it, but um, probably pictorially on the second pullout, 11 by 17, uh, where the drawing is labeled inlet and piping layout, uh, that inlet and piping layout was designed to comply with the township ordinances. 
So even though you didn't have time to do it in LR9, you did it in LR10, and that's an actual design, correct? That is correct. And as a result of that actual design, is there any, in your examination, is there anything regarding the existing proposed developer property that would prevent the avoidance of that wing? No. So let's go to item 12. Waiver 345-311B12. Is that also addressed in LNR 10? No. It's addressed in LNR 9. Number 12? Number 12. Number 12 deals with the uh, uh, one foot of cover that is addressed in LNR 9. And because of the vertical alignment um, that was, um, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. My mistake. I saw. I saw the uh, the waiver comment. No, that is correct. It was not addressed in LNR nine. It was addressed in LNR ten, when the vertical alignment of the connector road was designed, and the the difference there is the Arna plan shows a a sag curve, which there were a couple of other areas on the plan, but there was uh, the one issue with the sag curve going up to Quail Hill Lane that caused a cover issue. The vertical alignment in uh, the L LTL uh, drawing here shows a essentially a very smooth arcing curve which provides more than enough cover, therefore the waiver would not be needed. So and it, it does come. There's nothing on the property that would require the granting of the waiver? No. So with regard to Item 13, 345-311-B-7. That apparently was not addressed in LNR 9. Was it addressed in LNR 10? Yes, it was. Please explain. Uh, that section deals with the, um, the, the four foot wide gutter requirement and the in LNR 10 what was done is the uh, the spacing of the inlets the uh, four foot gutter spread was analyzed and uh, a sufficient inlets were added to reduce the gutter spread below four foot in addition to that um, they were um, additional inlets were, were located and also the uh, the alignment was considered to ensure that uh, we could be under the four foot requirement and therefore complying with the township's ordinances. And is that shown in any of the plans or the data on LNR 10? Yes, yes it is. Was that data prepared? There's a table that was prepared in LNR 10 on page, here we go, um, on page 22 that shows, it lists the inlets, the design storm, the lo longitudinal slope, cross slope, and then ultimately the uh, gutter spread. And uh, so sheet 22 in LNR 10 uh, confirms compliance with the ordinance requirements. As laid out by LTL. Correct. Are we at 13? Mm, that was 13. Uh, 14, I believe. The item, I think, 14. 14 is 350.35D. This is the issue with regard to intersecting North Guthrie's Road. 
at Quail Hill Lane, correct. Mr. Thacker said that that could not be done. Please explain. LPL's contrary determination. Okay, essentially what was done is we provided a horizontal alignment that lined up with the, the center line intersection of Quail Hill Lane at, at its existing center line and then located a 750 foot radius at a bearing uh, that would allow for the 50 foot wide radius to miss the corner of the northernmost BVA property corner and still allow for a 750 foot radius and come in without any uh, uh, tangent sections or broken back curves and tie directly into Horseshoe Pike with a, at a 90 degree angle. So Mr. Thacker thought that he could not make that because if there wasn't enough room on the condemned property and the, uh, the proposed development property, but you indicate that it can be done. We indicate that it can be done, yes. And now that alignment does uh, come cross over some of the proposed square footage that Carlino wants to exactly. propose. Am I correct? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. I, I asked a bad question. And I don't want to repeat the plan. So I believe we're at 15. And I think. Mr. Thacker indicated that there were two aspects of the waiver that was part of 350-35 um, B and C, which is I think where we're at now. There was one was the 750 radius alignment, which I think you've already mentioned, and then because they were designing a reverse curve, they needed relief from the tangent section of the reverse curve, but that's not necessary in this alignment. Is that correct? Well, first of all, it was section 350.33 B and C, not, not 35. However, okay, thank the, you if, you if I said the wrong thing, thanks for correcting me. However, the crux of your question I is correct, which is, the LTL alignment has a 750 foot radius that has one point of tangency directly down at a 90 degree angle with uh, Horseshoe Pike. And there's nothing on the property that prevents that alignment? No. Now, with regard to item 16, which is a waiver request of 345-311.B1. You didn't think a waiver would be needed in LNR 9, but you didn't analyze it. Did you analyze it in LNR 10? Yes, we did not analyze it in LNR 9, but we did analyze it in LNR 10, that's What's correct. What's the result of the analysis? The result of the, result of the analysis on LNR 10, Comment 16 uh, references, uh, probably could be more accurately shown here on the second, the second of the 11 by 17 pullouts that's labeled inlet and piping layout. And because <coughs> the, uh, the basin location w was moved and we had the opportunity to, the basin two now outflows uh, directly and ties into the same outfall pipe that ultimately discharged Basin 1 and Basin 3 in the LTL alternate alignment. So there's no need to go into the uh, right-of-way of North Guthriesville Road. So the waiver is not needed because we'll no longer be in that location. And that eliminates that waiver. That's, cor that's correct. Now... The 
request a waiver for 345-311-B2. You did not have a chance to analyze that in LNR 9, but you did in LNR 10. Am I correct? I think it's item 17. To the extent that an analysis was necessary, yes, that's correct. Okay, well, please explain. Okay. The requirement in 17, section 345-311.B, parentheses 2, really deals with a pipe material issue, and to avoid that waiver, we just simply would use a concrete pipe versus the, I believe, the HDPE that was proposed in the ARNA plan that necessitated the waiver request. And as a result of your analysis, there's nothing on the property that would prevent avoiding that waiver. Am I correct? That is correct. With regard to number 18, the ... First of all, I'm going to look at LNR 9, and then I need to also refer to LNR 10 because it looks like, frankly, the analysis for the requested waiver of 350-36B ... That involves the turn lane, correct? Which is allowed by engineering. Yes, that is correct. And please, I think it's just quicker if you just tell us what you did and what the results of that analysis are. Do you want me to testify to it? No, because it's in 10. It's in LNR 10. Yes, that's correct. Essentially, the only statement in LNR 9 is that we provided an additional 42 feet of the deceleration or turn lane. However, in LNR 10, we provided additional information, and if you look at the very back of LNR 10, the last two 8.5 by 11 sheets will show essentially an analysis, and that is a snapshot of an ARNA plan. I don't want to say which one. I'm not certain of which one it is, but it is one that you would use to show the layout and the compliance with the deceleration or turning lane. That one is labeled ... Where are you again, Mr. Ulrich? LNR 10, the last two sheets are 8.5 by 11s. Okay, go ahead. The second last sheet is labeled ARNA plan deceleration lane exhibit. Okay? So that shows that ... and if I could back up just one second. In LNR 10, if you look at the page 4 of the report, there is text that substantiates the need for 220 feet as the length that's required for the deceleration lane. So in an effort of not going through that, it can certainly be read and tried to lay it out so that it's pretty straightforward as far as what's going on and what's needed. Then if you go back to, again, the second last page, the 8.5 by 11, the ARNA plan shows that the critical points really are the physical obstructions. So from the start of the deceleration lane going from top to bottom, you have 201 feet to the pedestrian crossing under the 220. That's important. This is the existing ARNA plan? That's correct. That's correct. This shows what is proposed by Carlino. That is correct. The second to the last sheet on 10? That's correct. I just want to be clear because I wasn't. However, I apologize. I did jump a little bit there. But the information in blue is information that LTL added on top of the ARNA plan. So that's the image work that LTL did on top of the ARNA plan. But that is the ARNA plan before you. 
So the 201 feet goes from the start of the, the taper to the pedestrian crosswalk at 201 feet, that short. The next physical obstruction really to, to comply with the intent of the ordinance, and again, looking back at the text, will kind of tie the two of those together. That shows that to the start of the, the, the pork chop island or the raised mountable island, you have 212 feet, which is still deficient. And then the last dimension is the distance to the center line, and then the, again, the 40 feet is just simply the difference uh, of those two. But then if you flip to the last page, the last page on LNR 10 shows and is labeled LTL alternate plan deceleration lane exhibit. And what that shows in the heavy black text, again, is an image that is representative of the uh, horizontal alignment that LTL had prepared to show uh, more substantial compliance with the ordinance requirements. And what that shows, again, going from top to bottom, is from the start of the deceleration lane, same place, it shows that by the shifting of the center line of that connector road, we were able to gain additional uh, length and actually exceed the requirements of the ordinance at to 230 feet versus the 220 feet that's required. And again, the next dimension below that would be the same uh, obstruction, which would be the, the pork chop island or decision point, and that is um, 235 feet, again, exceeding the 220 feet required. And the 280 feet really shows the distance from the, the start of the taper to the physical center line of the uh, alternate alignment, LTL alignment. And the last two sheets of LNR 10, which you've just described, contrast the proposed ARNA plan measurements and the results if the LTL alignment with 322 were to be employed. That's the comparison of those two numbers? That's correct. So with the alignment as you're showing in that the first pullout of LNR 9 and as also illustrated on the last sheet of LNR 10, when the alignment starts there on 322, that's also contributing to eliminating the waivers and on the need for radii and the need and the compliance with turning templates and the ability to meet turning templates as well, correct? It all sort of falls together. I wouldn't say it isn't tied to the radii portion of it at the entrance. That's internal. But the last two that you had suggested regarding turning templates, yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Now, I think you looked at LNR 8 before, which you described as the and with the yellow highlighting that showed the part of the condemned property not being used. I just want to ask you, is more of the condemned property being used in the proposed alignment of the LNR layer? I don't think that's what his question was. Overruled. Please respond. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you, can, what was that again? What was the question? What was the question? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Have a read it back. I'm sorry. Can you, can you read back? I would like the question read back and the answer, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Jean, 
you have anything I else? I can explain I'm if you want me to. Yeah, can you can ask that? a question. Yeah, I don't really understand that. Can, could I explain? Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Yeah. And Mr. Winters apparently has a follow-up question, if that's all right. I have no objections. Can, okay. Um, explain. What Attorney Orlando was pointing out was the the existing entrant that, that was not occupying the same space and being utilized by the current ARNA plan, Carlino plan layout. Because this layout that is proposed in LR10, you can see that it shifts in this direction and more closely aligns with the existing layout. I'm sorry, the existing entrance layout. Okay, Mr. Mr. Olick, only a few more questions. First of all, if you look back at LNR 9, you do, in blue, show adjustments in the total square footage of building that contrast from the ARNA plan as laid out to what the result would be if the LTL road alignment were. I'm sorry, it's in the first sheet. Mr. Orlando, LNR 9 is 300 pages long. Can you I, be I, specific I apologize. about I, I, I'm sorry, thank you for. I was referring at the, at the last, at the end of the narrative portion of LNR 9, there are three 11 by 17 plans. The first one of those plans is what I was looking at. So thank you, Mr. Fisher. I apologize for being confusing. So I, I just want to, because the reality is this alignment costs some square footage. I just want to hit two or three very small points and then I think I'm done. The, you're showing in blue the changes that would result in the square footage compared to what the developer has shown on its plan versus the amount of square footage that would result if the LTL alignment were adopted for the road. Is that an accurate statement? That is correct. And yeah, the, in the on the same plan, the first 11 by 17 at the uh, very end of the narrative under LNR 9, you also show in blue at the top right hand resulting numbers that would change for parking and for impervious coverage, and that's shown in blue, correct? Correct. But the blue numbers are, were put on by LTL, and as configured and as changed by the blue numbers, does the parking for an alternate layout comply with all township ordinances in the LTL layout on this property? Yes, it does. And the developer is proposing to use porous pavement in two areas on the plan, which Mr. Klein agreed with me are not overflow or reserve parking. You know where those areas are, Mr. Roller? Yes. Okay. And as, as a result of the LTL alignment of the roadway and the stormwater designs and the basins, all of which you're showing on sheets one, two, and three that immediately follow the narrative on LNR 9. They also comply with these Brandywine Township saldo and stormwater ordinances, do they not? Uh, that's correct. And if and I if I could if I could expand just a second, it's worth noting because of where you brought it up. Um, if you look, it's very difficult to see. I do have larger plans. We could set them out if you're interested. That's your call. But I'd like to suggest, if you have, you have larger versions of these? Yes, I do. Okay, then here's what I want to do. I want to I mark, before you, hold your thought, but I'd like, so that everyone can see, and do we have copies for Mark? 
I'd like to yeah. mark those as L and R nine A, B, and C, so that they're easier to read than these eleven by seventeens. So, uh, but go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Olick. Tell us. No, no, no. Don't oh, do it okay. now. Just okay. Your so, testimony. well, I, I mean, I have a difficulty reading the number as well, but I, I, I think I can make them out. But if you look at that in blue, what you'll see is, is for, for the longest time we've uh, raised issue with the amount of impervious coverage and the fact that um, the, the developer was looking to disregard porous paving as an impervious surface to keep them under the uh, impervious coverage requirements. So, and again, uh, th their numbers exceeded the, uh, I believe it's a 65%, I'm gonna need to see the plan as well, but th they exceeded that amount, but by reducing or subtracting the porous pavement in these areas, they were able to stay under the impervious coverage requirements. Well, with the LTL alignment, realignment here and recalculating the impervious coverage, <coughs> excuse me, and the elimination of one of those porous pavement areas, we would, uh, this, this alignment would bring that into, into compliance with that zoning requirement. However, here's the other important thing because we've also raised issue about using porous pavement in a, a parking area and the fact that the reason that you call out for porous pavement in a reserve or an overflow parking area is because of the amount of traffic that it's going to get and all the people backing in and out on a hot summer's day and porous pavement, the whole, the, the very construction of it eliminates fines. That's, that's how you get a porous pavement. So it's not going to be uh, as structurally solid as, as a conventional hot mix type of pavement. So in that particular case, with our alignment and the elimination of the one porous pavement area there, you would reduce the amount of porous pavement that by the other areas that are out in front of the giant here, okay? However, because of the reduction in the impervious coverage amount, even if that porous pavement were changed to a conventional pavement, adding them in together, we would still be below the 65%. So, so would it, it would eliminate a, a zoning ordinance issue as well. Wait a minute. You're saying that with this stormwater design and this road alignment, you can eliminate the need to use porous pavement and still comply with the total impervious coverage required by the zoning ordinance? Yes. That's correct, yes. Okay. I think I'm, I think I'm done with direct... Okay, look at sheet three of LNR 9, the, the third 11 by 17. One thing I forgot to ask you, which Mr. Prince kindly pointed out. You have three, you have a sheet here that's got Looks to me like three different colors. I'm colorblind, so you have to tell me how many there are. But I think there are three different colors. Tell us why they, what they are, and what they represent. Okay. The the uh, third sheet that Mr. Orlando is referring to shows essentially that taking the basins one at a time. Basin one is the area highlighted in blue, and it shows effectively uh, the surface runoff that would fall in that area would eventually and ultimately make it to Basin 1. Yeah. Uh, similarly for Basin 3 in yellow and then also Basin 2 in green. And I, I didn't point this out before but I think that I'm pointing it out now is it's also appropriate to bring up. Another issue that was brought up many times in the past was about controlling stormwater on your own site. And if you look back at those reports, you'll see that, that the, the layout that the developer currently has in front of you has, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to object to this. There's, there's, it's been determined time and again that there's nothing wrong with the stormwater coming from the main part of the site onto the detention basin up near um, uh, uh, the that. road in the back. Yeah, I would just. He's allowed to finish answering his question. Yeah, but he, he, this is this is legal oh. argument over an issue that has been argument. resolved. I don't even remember what the question was, but I think he's going beyond it. If you could stick to answering the question that Mr. Orlando asked. Yes. Okay. I'm I sorry. Then the, the the last portion of that was the area in green shows the surface area 
that would ultimately drain to Basin 2. And is there, in fact, a stormwater ordinance section in East Brandywine Township that says that the uh, imperative is to try to control as much of your own stormwater on your own site as possible? Objection. Is there, I Mr. Orwick? Do you know? Objection. Ask for a legal conclusion. He's an engineer. He's an engineer. He designed He's a, a storm. Objection overruled. Thank Answer you. the question. Uh, yes, there is. It was brought up before, and... Uh, Yes. Cross examine. Sure. Now, Mr. Ulrich, let me, give me one second. No, no, I, I'm good. I'm good. So, Mr. Orlando alluded to this. If we look, I have in front of me sheet number 20 in the in the Arna plans, which is exhibit B3. three in the township's book. Yes. And I have your um, I, first sheet of the three that are in BBA or LNR 9. Do you have those two in front of you? Did you say sheet 20 of 34? That's what I said, the site plan. Oh, I have a detail sheet, it's 20 of 34. <laughs> Drawing number 20? Maybe? Yes, yes. Okay. In the book, this is sheet number 20. It says drawing number 20. Think, okay, well, that's Oh, oh I apologize. Drawing number 20. I apologize. 20. Sheet 5. Drawing 20.00. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now I have the two of them in front of me. And what I understand that you've done in your first sheet in LNR 9 is you've taken that same drawing and you've overlaid a new road configuration on it, right? Yes, that's correct. And in doing so, you reduce the size of the shopping center, the retail space in the shopping center, didn't you? We eliminated retail B and reduced the size of retail A. Okay, so let's see in more detail So you eliminated retail B, right? That's correct. So it's no longer a shopping center, is it? It's just got one single tenant, right? I don't know. You don't know. It, uh, we were told to provide for a giant supermarket. You were told that by was the who direction. To, you that, were told by who? That was the direction we received from Attorney Orlando and Attorney Prince. Oh, okay, that's not something you came up with. You were directed to do it by Prince and Orlando. We right? were directed, as indicated on the front of these, the design assumptions was to provide for a giant supermarket and to minimize or eliminate the waivers that were requested in the waiver request letter with the 19 waivers in it. Okay, so you reduce the size of the giant shopping uh, supermarket from 5,600, I'm sorry, 56,150 feet to 54,290 feet, didn't you? You said 56,150? Yes, to 54,290. I'm showing 64,290. I'm I'm seeing a reduction from 65,400 down to 64,290. Right. That's right. Sheet 5 on Exhibit B3, which is the plan, shows total retail A, 65,400 square feet. I think you were going to break it up. I'm breaking up the... The expansion um, area. I'm breaking up the supermarket area from the expansion area. Okay. 
the... But you're asking them, excuse me. Excuse me, let me ask my question. Well, but I'm simply pointing out because we're all trying to see where you're looking. You're asking him what his numbers are, so you've got to look at L&R 9, not, not your plan. You, you asked him, how much is he reducing it? That's in the blue. Yeah, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking how much you reduce the base supermarket from n not the total retail, but the base supermarket that was shown on our drawing number 20. Not at all. I'm considering the base supermarket, if you'd like to define it better, I could do that, but I'm considering the base supermarket, not the retail A future expansion, nor retail B. So the base supermarket was we not... We need the big plan. Where's the big plan? It's, I can grab that if you like. We can't tell from your drawings. But you can tell from the small one in B3. Look at sheet 5 what? of 34, drawing number 20, I which is see part of B3. But we can't tell what his... Okay, but look at mine, because it's showing. It's very clear. But wait, they have there's there's a there's his? No, he says... <coughs> yeah, he's yeah, it is. Right. It's wait, clear I'm, to me I'm when you read what? it. But he's going to put it in the big plan. I, I, I don't show understand. Your you're, you're, you're what? We're looking at... I'm L looking at sheet number 5 of 34, drawing number 20.00, and it shows retail A... It says first floor, second floor mezzanine, total retail A, 56,150. Then it says future expansion, 9,250. 9, total retail A with expansion, 65,400. Okay, what I understand is you're asking him to compare 56,150 with whatever he shows on his plan. But we can't see what he shows That's on his plan without he's looking at the big plan. That's he has the large plan now, so okay. I think you'll be able to see it more clearly. And this is the large plan of your plan? Yes, these I'd like to have these separate okay, priority in the un record and for everybody's, for their sake. For everybody's so, old eyes. We'll make them LNR, LNR 9A, LNR 9B, LNR 9C. It's <coughs> identical to what's in LNR 9, but it's large enough for anybody. But it's just those three plan sheets. Yes. Okay. Just those three Understood. Three they're full blueprint size. Yeah, they're full, they're full plan size. I'm, I'm not trying to cry anymore. I'm just. You're still sneezing. I'm sorry. He did keep us. I think I caught it. So let me just stand here. Let me understand what you have eliminated in terms of retail square footage. Are you saying to me that the base retail A, you have not changed at all? That is correct. But you eliminated, number one, the future expansion. Retail B was eliminated. Now it says retail a future expansion. That, that was not eliminated. It, was, it had a width uh, on the ARNA plan of 50 feet, and it was reduced to 44 feet. So it was reduced in size. The length is the same. It was reduced, it was reduced from 50 feet, 50 feet wide to 44 feet wide. Unchanged, 50 feet to 44 feet, retail B was eliminated. And did you get permission to do that from Giant? No, I did not. You don't know whether Giant would accept that or not, would you? No, I do not. And then you eliminated 4,600 square feet of retail space? Retail B, you completely eliminated it. 4,600 square feet of retail B was eliminated completely, yes. Did you do any economic analysis of what the elimination of those two pieces of space would have on the viability of the shopping center? Objection, Your Honor. The it's overruled. He can answer it. May I, may I voice the objection, please? 
The plans do not show the elimination of the space. The plan show that it, the space in question is within the township setback requirement. That's not an elimination. He testified that he eliminated parcel B. He eliminated sorry, retail sorry, space B is what his testimony was. Look at the drawing. Wait a minute. Why is he, on on the, he, yeah. he just testified that he eliminated exactly. retail B. Overruled. And you eliminated, give me that number. And 1,110 square feet of the expansion space. Of retail A future expansion, yes, that's correct. And you did not obtain permission from uh, Giant, so you don't know whether Giant would agree to that, do you? No, I do not. And you didn't do any economic analysis of, of, of reducing this center by over... 5,700 square feet to determine whether or not the center would be still viable. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. How many parking spaces did you eliminate? Only 28 parking spaces. Eight parking spaces, that's correct. You changed the configuration of the parking uh, of the parking lot, didn't you? Slightly, yes. Slightly, yes, in that you did what? Well, the area in here is untouched. The only, uh, the only modification to the parking was done because of the alignment of the road. So to tie it in, we relayed out we laid out the parking to comply with the ordinance and still provided access, a rear access that actually works from a safety standpoint, and a front entrance access that actually works. I can assume that you didn't you didn't ask Giant whether that would be satisfactory to them, did you? No. just took the road and you moved the road over. Is that correct? We realigned the road to comply with the township's ordinance to the greatest extent possible and tied into the ARNA plan to the greatest extent possible. There are still other issues on that we've <coughs> illustrated on the ARNA plan, but the main issue was the connector road. So my question to you was, after you realigned that road, did you determine whether or not the rest of the plan complied with the zoning ordinance and all of the other requirements of the SALDO? To the extent of the modifications that we did, yes. To the balance that we did not touch, no. So you, so you don't know whether your moving the road affected any other part of the uh, shopping center's compliance with the ordinances. Oh, no, I don't believe it has, no. You don't know? I, or you... I know, I do not believe it has, no. no. That's why we looked at parking, that's why we looked at the other issues that were, uh, that we've highlighted in blue. It was to address the ordinance uh, waivers and deficiencies. Well, let me make sure that I, I totally understand what you did. You took the road and you moved the road and you said that by moving the road, you would eliminate
eliminate the waivers that were requested uh, by the Arnold plan, right? We would eliminate the waivers it, to the greatest extent possible that were associated with the waiver request letter. So you never looked at the ARNA waivers with the road in the place for where the road was set to determine whether ARNA had justified those waivers, assuming that the road would stay in, in the place that it was situated. Could you restate that? I'm not sure I'm following you. Closer to the okay. This year. I understand that what you did was you shifted the road and you then said, when I shift the road, I will eliminate um, most, if not all, of the waivers that Arna requested, right? That is correct. Okay. But you did not look at the ARNA plan with the road in place where ARNA designed it and analyzed the justification for each of the 18 waivers that ARNA requested. You didn't do an analysis of each of those waivers and uh, whether they would cause any problem or whether they were minor, you didn't you didn't make any subject you didn't make any quantitative or qualitative analysis uh, about uh, regarding the justification that uh, Sharag gave us for those waivers, did you? Objection. He most certainly did. It's the report that's submitted as a board exhibit. Can you get this guy to be quiet? I he stated questions. an objection, and the objection has been overruled. All I'm asking is that he asked one at a time. That was like five questions. No, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Give a, uh, I have no objection to the, to the subject matter, but have it, how about one at a time? I only asked one question. Can you answer the question? Yes. Can I? Yes. Please. Do. Okay. Uh, what I was going to say is I believe we have repeatedly uh, indicated that the waivers were not justified simply by the preparation of LNR 9 and LNR 10. Yeah, but that's not the question I ask you. Okay. Well, it's not the answer you want. That's the answer he gave. So okay. you're stuck with okay. it. Okay. So your, your critique of our waiver requests is in the documents that you presented before you gave us uh, LNR, R, LNR 9 and 10, right? You, you, in your original report, you critiqued the ARNA waivers, did you not? Okay, you went on with a couple of questions. I'll answer the Go first ahead. one. Go ahead. Essentially, the first one is the preparation of LNR 9 and LNR 10 show by their very creation that there can't be a hardship, again, in our opinion, for the preparation of the report to justify the waiver request if we've shown an alignment that complies with the township's ordinances. But if you assume that the road has to stay where it is, you did not analyze the justifications that were made by uh, Arna, did you? Again, I, I feel that's the same question. I think I... No, I just, answer my, just answer my question, yes or no. It's not a yes or no answer. It's been answered yeah, yeah, twice. I agree. Move on. He, he answered it whether you like the answer or not. Looking at your first sheet, the, I'm sorry, the first of the three drawings, sheet number 20, which, which, LNR 9. Which the large one we've marked is LNR 9A. Hey, thank right. you. So I don't know if you have it, want to look at the large one. I have that. It's got it right in front of you. Yep. So what I understand that you did here is that you moved the road over to the left or to the west 
and then turned the road as you got to onto the former LNR property, and in order to it, in order for it to align with Quail Hill. Do I understand that correctly? Generally, yes. Okay, but if the road were to remain in its location as set forth on the Arna plan, you wouldn't have been able to turn the road the way you did to align with Quail Hill without violating any number of the dimensional requirements and layout requirements uh, for uh, a road, would you? That's correct. So, oh, that's correct, thank you. Let's, let's go to the other side of that, that if, excuse me one second. If the road, if the connector road were to be fixed as Arna fixed it on sheet 20 at its intersection with 322. That road couldn't have been designed without the waivers that Arna requested. Objection, right? that's the same question. No, it's, it's the same question. Well, different question. I don't, I, I'm not sure I followed your question. Uh, there was another question. If you could restate it or. I think the last question focused on its alignment with North Guthriesville, and yeah, I think this question the, yeah. is focusing on its alignment with 322. Three <coughs> that's, yeah. that's the, I would draw that was my, my understanding if that's of what he you, actually asked. Can you read my question back, please? Oh, I won't hmm? understand. That's what no, you I mean? know, but I'm not sure that Norm understood it, so <laughs> let's just read it back. Again, let me restate it to. Uh, right. it, Can you answer that? Wait, uh, it's no, I, I it's, it's susceptible of a yes or no answer, and then you can okay. explain it. No. Okay, I'm not understanding your question. Okay, if I could restate it, and you tell me that you agree with that, I've restated it, I will respond. Go ahead. Let me okay. See. What I understood you to say is if the Arna layout could not be located where it is. Without the waivers, okay, well, again, you're going to have to restate if it. If you assume that the road has to be where Arna put it, isn't it true that that road could not be, that alignment could not be designed without the waivers or modifications that Arna requested? Again, talking on the southern end of it, yes, a portion of those waivers. I would agree with that for some of the waivers, yes. I have no further questions. Do you have any redirect? Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Prince is up. I think I'm entitled to this question. Well, you were whispering in his ear asking questions, so that's why I assumed I'm, you were already done. But I'm, please I'm proceed. I'm Mr. Prince. I would yield okay. to Mr. Prince. That's fine. I wasn't saying that criticizing. I'm saying I thought it was a team effort because you were offering things for him to ask. So please proceed. 
Mr. Ulrich, I think you still have in front of you the board exhibit book. Do you? Yes, I do. Would you please turn to exhibit 29? Let me know when you have it in front of you. I do. I want you to turn, if you'd be so kind, to page three. Page three, three. of exhibit B29. OK. At the bottom of that page, there is a quotation from the Commonwealth Court decision in Lake McLeod Homeowners. That's capital M-A-C, capital L-E-O-D. And I want to just read to you the two sentences, and then I want to ask you about them. It says, Objection. and you this is this is totally a legal issue. We've cited other cases that say something a little bit different. He hasn't even gotten to the question yet, though. So let him. I'm going to let him read this in the. Well, he doesn't now. need to read it. Read it to yourself, and then ask the question. Everybody has it in Could front you, of them and can read. Would you read the two sentences to yourself? The first one on the bottom of page three, and then the next one that appears on the top of page two. Let me know when you're done. My copy of the board book does not have all the pages. <laughs> Mine doesn't have page four either. Mine does. I believe this might be another issue, Christian, sure. about photocopying. Yeah, I mean, sign. mine does. As some of them do. It might well, for this situation, go ahead and read it aloud if you wanted to. And, and he doesn't have page sure four. No, no. I don't have those pages. So but That's what I'm saying. Mr. Ehrlich does. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, in quotes, indeed, in light of the fact that prior to the applicant's proposed development, the subject property was unimproved. It is unclear why applicant could not lay out its private streets in a manner that complies with section 78-39 paren capital K of the Saldo's requirements. As such, the supervisors erred in determining that waivers from the literal enforcement of that provision were necessary to prevent undue hardship based on the peculiar conditions of the subject property." End quote. Now, with regard to the watcher's property itself that is proposed for the Carlino development, is it unimproved as it stands today? Other than the existing entrance and the stormwater basin, yes. Do you know of any reason why a street could not be laid out on that unimproved property that complies with this township Saldo requirements? No. Now, jumping around a little bit, would you go to B28? And would you tell us what that is? B28. B is in board. That's LTL's report prepared dated November 1st, 2018. Was that a critique of Mr. Thakkar's ARNA submission that constitutes the basis of this uh, Carlino plan that's in review by this board? Yes. Did you review in that report the individual waiver requests Yes. Did you render an engineering op uh, opinion to a reasonable degree of certainty as to whether or not those waivers were each and every one justified, given the unimproved nature of the property in question? Yes. Did you conclude that the waivers were unjustified? Correct, yes. Mr. 
Kaplan asked you whether you eliminated retail B. Now, first of all, you weren't employed by Giant, were you? <coughs> you weren't employed by Carlino either. No. And just so it's clear, is it fair to say that LTL is by and large, with rare exception, an engineering firm that only does municipal work for municipalities? That is correct. Is it fair to say that only on rare occasion will you privately review a plan for a private property owner? Yes. Now this retail B that you agreed you eliminated, is it fair to say that what you meant was that you excluded retail B space from calculations of necessary parking, stormwater, etc. Objection. He, he's already testified that he eliminated it. Well, but he Either he eliminate eliminated it or road, he You can answer the question. Thank you. Retail B was eliminated because of the revised roadway layout. It was not taken into consideration with parking calculations because it did not exist. But to comply with the township's ordinance, as we've stated all along, that there are, there's essentially too much going on for the site. So by the elimination of retail B and the reduced size of the future expansion of retail A, all of a sudden there are things that are coming into compliance that were issues before, most notably, this coverage now. So that's, now, I'm sorry, that's what happened. I'm going to ask you to come up here and just look at this plan a minute, which is, uh, 9B. I have the blown up. And 9B so shows a hatched black line running essentially between the food store expansion and retail B. Correct? Correct. And for the record, what is that hatched brown line? It's a setback. Okay. So it was necessary to beat the township ordinance on road setbacks to eliminate retail B from consideration. Is that right? That's correct. In addition to making the future expansion of retail A smaller, from 50 feet wide to 44 feet wide. For the same reason, correct? That's correct. Now, isn't it also true that just as Mr. Gambone had to secure a variance with regard to a bank being within 85 feet of the road, that Carlino could come into the township and request a variance to build retail B, even though it was within the road setback. I can't speak of Mr. Gambone and, and being obtaining a variance, but the second part of your, your statement, I would agree with that that is afforded and available to uh, the developer if they so choose. Mr. Fisher, in 2010, in a meeting that's documented in his big book, opined to Mr. Kaplan and I believe Mr. Miller that the lot in question, the watcher's property, wasn't big enough for what they wanted to do with it. Sitting here today, having gone through four formal plans, at least 12 variations, all of which have shown essentially the exact same plan. Is this plan that they have presented too big for the lot in question, as Mr. Fisher opined nine years ago? I strongly believe that. Am I correct that your task was not to design a development plan, a land development plan for Carlino? That is correct. Am I not correct that your task assigned by council was to examine whether or not, given the properties it stands, the unimproved property as it is, 
whether or not a connector road could be built on that property that would satisfy the township zoning and subdivision requirements to the largest extent possible yes are you satisfied sitting here today that this undeveloped piece of property could be the subject of a retail design land development design with a road that satisfies the township requirements yes I am do you know of anything inherent on the property itself any hardship that prevents a competent engineer from designing a road that satisfies the township requirements on this property connecting with Route 322 and North Guthriesville Road? No, I do not. Thank you. That's all. I have no further questions. Thank you. I have, um, I have one question. I, I have more oh. recourse if you okay. don't mind. Yeah, that would be better. Uh, Mr. Ulrich, in reviewing the township zoning ordinance and Saldo ordinance, isn't it true that Carlino is not required to construct this um, connector road from 322 back to Guthriesville Road? There's no zoning ordinance requirement for that, is there? I believe that's correct, yes. And that was only done, you've been here for all of the testimony, and you've heard, or most of the testimony, and you've heard it said that when Carlino first came to the township, the township demanded, directed, whatever word you want to use, that there be a connector road between 322 and Guthriesville Road. Isn't Under that object? your understanding? Objection, objection. Now, Mr. Kaplan is presenting testimony in the record about township statements, Give none of which right. have exactly ever. Exactly what Mr. Prince just did about Mr. <laughs> Fisher in 2000, whatever. Objections overruled. Please Except answer the question. There was no objection to that question. There is an objection to this one. He's you, it's hasn't it's asked a question. He asked it. He let him answer the question. I've not heard any testimony that where the township required the connector road or to connect I've, I've definitely heard it I can't say that I've heard it being said under oath that was from the township or any correspondence to that effect didn't you weren't you here when Andy Heinrich testified I was here yes the most recent time yes and didn't you hear him say that he directed the location of the connector road objection that's not, that's what, not he said. what he said and I have that testimony with us he said he made a recommendation. Well, the period. record will reflect what it was. It's cross-examination. Can you answer the question? I do not recall Mr. Heinrich saying that. Um, however, I've heard it earlier today being discussed. But no, I, I, I was here. I was not actively listening to his testimony. I can't say that I heard him say that, no. So let, you, we have your alternative uh, road here. Wait, let me strike that. Have you ever seen the plan that Carlino originally submitted without a connector road? No, I have not. Way beyond redirect. Way it, beyond it, recall. It, 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 it is I, I not would agree. I would agree. Objection sustained. second. Mr. Ulrich, if instead of having this connector road located on the Carlino property, there was just a simple driveway entrance from Route 322 back to the supermarket, wouldn't that 
Wouldn't that eliminate all of the waivers with regard to the road uh, alignment that you have criticized? Objection. Objection. With regard to what plan? And How can he say that without a plan yeah. to look yeah, at? Objection is the same. If I understand what you said, Mr. Ulrich, um, you said that if we wanted, if Carlino wants to build retail B, it could go to the zoning hearing board and ask for a variance. Did I hear you say that? No. That's what I thought I heard. No, what I said was okay. if they wanted to, if you wanted to construct something inside the building setback line, you could go to the zoning hearing board for a variance. I said nothing about retail B to my recollection. In, in, in order to do what you've just suggested, uh, there would have to be proof of a hardship, wouldn't it? Correct. And, and wouldn't the location of the road uh, be a hardship? No. Then what basis could you, would you have been suggesting that well, Carlino could go to the zoning hearing board and get a variance? Objection well, to now he's asking him to speculate about a zoning variance. Well, That's but it came out from the questions you asked him. No, I asked him. Right, so it's but questions you asked said him. You Objections overruled. Ask. You can always Objection go Objection is overruled. Could you repeat that again? No. You brought it up in your questioning, I, Mr. I, Prince. <laughs> Could you read it back, please? Please. <laughs> okay, um, very simply that the uh, design assumptions that we were given and the instructions that we were given to prepare LNR 9 and LNR 10 were that the uh, giant food store remain largely in the location that it is. There's nothing to preclude um, uh, the developer from changing the location of the supermarket, reconfiguring, changing the layout, modifying it in a way that you could potentially get retail B on there. But you didn't do that? No. You eliminated retail B? Based on the direction we were told to do, yes, that was exactly what we did. I have no further questions. Mr. Winters, you said you had a question? Uh, yeah, actually I have two. Um, is you had said that you do mostly, or your company, LTL, does municipal work for townships. Is it, is it, um, whose responsibility is it to make sure that a land development project can meet the requirements versus, I keep hearing things about size and, and um, is that a township's responsibility or is that a applicant's? Well, it's an applicant's responsibility. It's the township's engineer through the township and as a uh, hired professional by the township to assure compliance. And that's, uh, that's in substantially large part what LTL does. We, re we are a municipal engineering firm that represent municipalities in any way they would need, whether it's road design, bridge replacement, or in this case, subdivision land development review. So it's not the township's responsibility to to be concerned about whether it's economical or if it can fit no, within and, that parcel? And to that end, um, it, I, I've done design for over a decade, and typically the way a project starts out like this is you have a piece of property, and you'll have a developer come in. They'll be in a position of equitable ownership. They'll come in, and they will say, what can I get with this property? It's called a yield sketch. Do, did them often. And you'll basically uh, sit there and say, what can I get out of this? Whether it's residential, whether it's uh, commercial, light industrial, whatever it might be. And you'll take the township's ordinance into account. You'll subtract off things that are necessary, whether they're wetlands, whether they're steep slopes, uh, to come up with net areas. And you'll go through the process that your ordinances lay out to find out what you can and cannot do with that property. Okay. 
And to me, the longer I've looked at this now for over four years, what I saw happen is we need this, we need this, we need this, and we need this. Let me know what waivers we're going to need. Let me know what zoning relief we're going to need. And it was, in my opinion, and I, I've seen this many, many, many times, it was done backwards. Because in a position of an equitable ownership, if you're not owning that, you've got the chance to find out what can I do with this property? Do I have the economic viability that Mr. Kaplan had suggested? And when I get that answer back and I don't like what I'm hearing, then you have the, the option to back out and to back off of that. Okay, so if, if, they, if their due diligence was not done on their part, that, that's not the township's responsibility to, to cave on waivers so that they've got a project that will work not their job it's not their responsibility you've got ordinances here that protect the uh the public and that's what it should be and that's why there's such a great concern when it comes to to safety to turning movements to to, to storm water things like that and all that that alignment in these lnr 9 and 10 shows is that when you do more closely if not completely comply with township ordinance that you can't in fact get the building at the size and maybe the particular location or layout that you might want. That should have been determined over a decade ago. Okay, well, I answer that. Um, secondly, is, does the MPC allow a township to require the construction of a road for a development, for proposed development? <sighs> require a construction? No, you typically, say, we want this road built, so you're gonna have to do it? Right. Can, can, Typically, what I've seen in uh, municipalities is you'll deal with road improvements, widenings, upgrades, uh, improvements like that, or known drainage problems, things like that. But as far as the connector road goes, um, no, I, I don't know specifically, and I really couldn't comment on that, that, that the MPC in any way says that, uh, now, in this particular case, there was property that was condemned. Okay, there's, there's a wholly different thing going on there. But as far as the connector road, and the uh, necessity to put that in, I, I don't know that the FPC addresses that. I don't know. That, I guess that may not be a legal question then, I guess. I think more, it certainly would start there. The design portion of it, I think I'd be more comfortable talking about. I have additional questions. So, Ms. Mr. Ulrich, what I heard you say is um, that there's too many improvements that's being put on this property and that that's why we have the problems that you're talking about. Is that a fair statement? There are too many improvements being proposed on the property that would allow for the compliance with the township's ordinances. Okay, and you have agreed with me that there is no ordinance requirement, that there is no ordinance provision that requires that a major thoroughfare, a connector road of this size, be constructed on the Carlino property. You have agreed with me on that. That is correct, yep. And if we then, isn't it true that if the connector road were eliminated from this, from this property and all there was was a simple entrance off of 322 that you would no longer have the opinion that uh, too much is being stuffed on this property? Objection. Isn't We're that correct? We're not calculating correct. the amount of land that's not in front of us. He, that's he, right. The not, same he, question was asked before that you sustained the objection. It, it's not. And this man can... just made a speech to Mr. Winters about how the problem with this property is that Carlino has tried to jam too much improvements on this property. And I have the right to ask him then if the road, if, if, if his opinion would be the same thing if the connector road were eliminated from the uh, Parlino property. Well, I think no objection plan. is sustained because I think it is similar that he doesn't have a plan in front of him. I'm not sure how he would answer that question. I can't you, you don't have to answer it. Oh. Okay, then I'm done. Okay, anything else that you have? Uh, no. Okay, so. Okay. One, one thing, the, there's been a lot back and forth on cross. You indicated that the first page of LNR 9 and the first page of LNR 10 accurately summarizes the direction and the assumptions that you were given to create LNR 9 and 10. Is that correct? Yes, I believe no that's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Do you have another witness, Mr. Orlando? Uh, I do. I have Mr. Kilcheski here. 
Uh, but I believe that uh, I do not need to call him. Okay. So are you well, let me clean up exhibit stuff because I have also okay. have Glenn's CV in the book. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Kilcheski, just so that um, you know who we're talking about, Glenn Kilcheski is a professional engineer licensed in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He is an employee of LTL and was uh, instrumental in enabling us Objection. to he's just He's going to, trying to explain what he's, I think, going to get rid of an exhibit. So just why don't you just get rid of the exhibit? Then let me finish, and we'll do that. He assisted in the uh, preparation of these documents. I didn't know whether or not Mr. Kaplan was going to have questions or wanted to challenge the stormwater calculations or the supporting documentation. And so just like the board has done, we wanted to provide Glenn and have him available in case that were to occur. That's why I put him in the book. Thank you. I do not believe that's necessary in light of Mr. Kaplan's not asking those questions or the board not asking them. And so we are not going to present Mr. Kilcheski, okay. and we can remove his CV from our exhibit book. Thank you. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we move all our exhibits. Okay. Yes. We'll talk about exhibits in a second. Do you have any other witnesses? I have no other witnesses. Okay. So everybody's witness testimony has been concluded. Do you want to break for lunch and come back and talk about yeah. admission of exhibits? I, I guess what I would like to do, and I was speaking with Mr. Fisher yeah. about it, but how long is it going to take us to deal with the exhibits? I don't know. Let, let me say this. Uh, rather than go through every single exhibit line by line by line, if you have specific objection, let's just deal with the ones you object to and, and just address those. Does that, does that make more sense? Yes. Can we do okay. it after lunch? Well, yeah, and I guess the next he question. He has to leave, though. At yeah, that thirds. was the next question. So if you wanted to have myself present, again, I will only be here until about 2.30. So I'm, I think we'll be done way before then. Why? We could do a short lunch. Why? Just, why can't? We, why? So, so let's do this. I don't understand this. why we can't get it done right now. What, That's what, what we're asking. How long do you think it's going to take so much to do for your team? side? Pardon? How long do you think it's going to take for your side? To, for what? Oh. To go through these exhibits. Can we do it now and get done by one o'clock? Yeah. Let's we can do it right now. Can we do that? Yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So. I guess yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's take a five-minute break, so if anybody needs to use the restroom. Thank you. And Mr. Allwood just asked if he could be dismissed, and I said yes to yeah. him, so he's just so right. clear. Okay. All right, so we'll take a five-minute break. break. We'll convene at 1215, and uh, it's just your, Thank you. you're free to go. Okay, we're going to go back on the record, guys. We're going to go back on the record, and we had discussion. I think everybody's in agreement that all of the exhibits that have been introduced, so for board exhibits, it's B1 through B60. 60. BVA is BVA 1 through BVA 19, although we've already agreed that BVA 7 and BVA 13 would not come in. And LNR is LNR 1 through, one through 10, including 9A, 9B, and 9C, but excluding 6. Excluding Mr. Kilcheski's CV. That's Which is 6. So everybody will agree that all of those exhibits can be admitted, and the board will give them the weight that they deserve. Is that correct, Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. Mr. Orlando? Yes, we all agree. We also agree then that the evidentiary portion of the hearing is closed. The court reporter will prepare the transcript from today's hearing. Upon the party's receipt of that transcript, which she typically sends it to us first, and I will disseminate it that very day because we get an email. Thank you, Jennifer. Upon your receipt of that, and I will document this in writing, the parties will have 30 days to file proposed findings of fact conclusions of law. When the township receives that, we will then have a period of 45 days to prepare a draft decision. And obviously then we'll have to make sure we have a hearing, a, a meeting scheduled where the board will render that decision. So we'll take a look at our calendar and I will document back in writing when the board expects that to occur. Is that That's satisfactory agreeable. to council? That's agreeable to me. That's Thank what you. we've agreed to. Yeah, I mean, I think your findings of fact conclusion of law can include a discussion portion on the relevant law and the legal issues you think the board needs to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else from the board? Board, have any questions on procedure? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. I'm going to need a check. Record. Yes, record closed.